All right, well, welcome everybody. Tonight is the 24th of November. We're rapidly approaching Thanksgiving for those of you in the States or wherever you might celebrate that. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you all are too. But we're going to anyhow have a regular uh, session tonight in the Dallas Personal Robotics Group. Uh, my name is Carl Ott, current president. Uh, DPRG has been around since 1984. And we just like to talk and build robot stuff and share what we're doing and share ideas and solve each other's problems, or at least try and act like we can. So uh, with that, uh, we'll start into our regular session here. And uh, we have our normal starter tonight is volunteered again. So Doug, I'll hand it over to you. And uh, then we'll just bounce around the table. Okay. Well, I didn't do too much on my robot. I did put these little screws in there to hold the sonic sensors down. So that was a good thing. And I moved the Arduino so that the body would fit. And that was all I had time to do on the actual robot. But I did get a chance to finally get my Visual Studio working because I was having a lot of trouble getting that to play with Python. I got that all configured. So I was happy about that. And then I studied up on how I was going to connect my Python or my Raspberry Pi to my Arduino. Now I decided one of these simple little USB cables is going to work for the serial connection, and that should work pretty good. I'm going to try that first. Hmm. And so I haven't actually done it yet, but I studied up on how to do it. I was actually driving a lot this week, so I didn't have a chance to touch the stuff. But I learned how to do it. We'll see. And also got my book. So that came in. I've read the first part of the table of contents, so I'm feeling pretty smart now. And uh, getting ready for my contest robot to be in the December 12th contest. I'm not going to do the line follow, but I'm going to see if I, my robot can win most interesting. And that's pretty much it for me. It's mostly a travel week. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Can't argue with that. Mm -hmm. Can't argue with that. All right. Oh, well, that's awesome. And uh, that's cool. So thank you for bringing that up about the contest, too, because... Uh, if you might be uh, watching online or haven't been paying attention, we, we have a virtual contest coming on the 12th of December. So there are two contests and one will be for send a video and uh, audience will vote on the most interesting or most snazzy or whatever. And the other contest will be a uh, no, no uh, holds barred kind of uh, celebrity line following match of sorts <laughs> in a virtual simulator. So. So we have that coming on the 12th of December, but uh, maybe more on that later. So next, let's bounce around. Let's see, Harold, I think uh, you came in kind of early tonight. So what's going on in Sarcasm Central? Oh, all kinds of stuff, actually. Um, uh, let me see if I can poke around just a little bit here. So I'm about to do a little soldering. I'm on my teensy. I make Murray happy. And I'll show you why. So this is a robot. It's in pieces. Because Murray, I've started on my thousand uh, rebuild of Mama Robots. Version 1000? Or something like that. I'm trying to keep it trying to keep up with you in the thousands and I'm in the tens at the moment. So I got to do this. So what happened was I got these new wheels. These are the old wheels. These are new wheels. Uh, and the new wheels are much nicer. Uh, lots more gription, as I coined a phrase on Twitter the other day. I actually, I got that from my brother from, I can't tell you how many years ago. He didn't know what friction was, but he called it, there's a gription. There's a gription on me. And you're like, okay, gription, got it. And um, turns out that, uh, I think I showed it off last week, the ball that I found at Harbor Freight for like, I don't know, a couple dollars, this thing is about as smooth as it gets. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. Put all the wheels on there, put it on there, put it on the floor. It ran for about two and a half, three seconds because it ran over a... Uh, it looked like it was going to move pretty good, but it ran over a little extension cable enough to jostle it, and then stuff stopped working. Oh. Uh huh? What's that? Well, one of the things is 
my uh the five volt connector here that powers the so the the everything in the in the uh brain world um it just jostled enough where that thing came on came disconnected and so when i was fixing fizzling around to do that i moved some more of these cables so this uh RoboClaw, my motor controller was down here in the bottom and i moved enough of these things so one of those came uncollected unconnected and I, and that was after I'd already taken this thing off once to get it stuff. Now I wasn't going to take it off again. And then I thought to myself, if I got to get in there every time, one, I need to build me. Some, I've got me some better. I have me some uh, better things now where I can build my own custom connectors here for this. Hey, Harold. Yes, sir. Are you crimp only or are you also soldering those little connectors? In, the, in these cases, they're, these little connectors are currently only uh they're just jumper cables you know jumper pre-made pre they're not pre-made i'm crimp th these are pre-made but i've got okay. some stuff to crimp my own and i'm going to crimp them up and put them give, give me some better links because one of the things i learned pretty early on when i'm making like my cables um the little dupont ones like those is mm -hmm. i crimp but i also solder them because i found that that level of real reliability was really it, you know, every once in a while, you'd find one that wasn't working, and it was because the crimp actually came out or whatever. Or, so or, I've been, or, I've been or, it's when you crimp down on them like that, it could be that you got crimped good on the insulation, but the other, but the actual wire and connectivity kind of just wallers around in there. You know. Yeah, so what? So what I'm doing is I'm pre-tinning, and then put it into the little metal thing, crimping it, and then I solder it, just heat it up, and then that solder that's on the wire already works usually pretty good, and you can't pull them out anymore then. Yeah. I, I think I think that's a grand idea, and so I'm going to roll with that when I when I build these things. So what's going to happen now is this is the top. I did have my USB uh, expansion mounted right here, but I've worked it out so that I can use all the ones off my the the the, the Latte Panda for right now. When I go to add a camera or other things, I have to do something else. But that's not what I have right now. So let's get. You know do the right now so what's what i'm going to end up doing i got enough wire enough cable and i'm going to slap this motor controller make sure people see it over here on the side to make that nice and easy to get to i and then am going to this is a this is a stand-in for what where my teensy is going to be and i've got enough room to put that right there so that i can run wires over to the motor controller and then have uh the usb coming out of here and then so everything is on top uh i don't have to take anything apart to my to go mess with this stuff because uh, i've got a feeling i'm gonna mess with it a lot um that sort of thing and and when i when i eventually figure out what i want which will probably be never if i'm you know, taking after my uh, hero murray there um i will uh i'm, I'm picking on you murray because i think you can take it so i'm just i'm just picking i'm just picking um but uh but it, 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 I think there's going to be a lot of changes. I'm going to do a lot of changes on it. So, and 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 the and the teensy, you got me sold. You really do, Murray. You got me sold for all the connectivity and all the stuff that it has. I have a feeling that once that goes down, I can power the whole rest of the robot um, with the real time off that one teensy, and then have the brains, uh, the 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 uh, Octave Panda doing the ML stuff and that kind of thing on there and talking to it. I, think there's enough juice between both of those i, I guarantee the teensy is going to be more than anything this little robot's going to do as far as sensors and all that stuff goes um the latte panda it's probably going to be okay but i got enough expansion where if i need to do a different one or make a little bigger one i can do that so cool. that's kind of where we're going to so that's kind of where we're going to go and so basically last night i tore it all apart on my stream after not really throwing a fit but wanting to throw a fit <laughs> um, uh, and that kind of stuff and um, looks good yeah i think it's i think it's going to fit way better and again you know how it goes you you, you try something it doesn't work you try something else you know and looks I know, like you though yeah all the, all the all the all the i know all the parts work i know this is going to be good when i get it back together it just it it, it got to be too weighty taking things apart and putting back things together and and also even though it seems like that's a bunch of wasted space down there. 
I'm thinking I can do other things down there that I barely even have to touch, if anything. Maybe just a, a good space to chuck wires and junk so they don't go flying around everywhere, you know, and they can push them down and come up these little holes and plug in to be real nice and tidy and not just flying everywhere on the thing. At the very least, you got to have space for some of that. Yeah. And, and I still have to, uh, this screen, the other thing I need to deal with, this screen needs five volts to power. And when I was powering it directly off the Latte Panda, it kept shutting down because I think I'm drawing too much power through the Latte Panda for this screen. So I'm just going to have to uh, uh, get me a USB connection and wire it direct for power into my five volts down here. And that ought to be, that ought to solve that problem. Well, Polo Lou has those little um, uh, five volt regulator power supplies, the little tiny ones. They're like yeah. half the size of a postage which, stamp, which, and they which, come in. Which is what that? it is right there. That's what one of those is. It's, and that's one of the five amp versions, too, which just wow. surprised the hell out of me that something that small can push five amps. So I got my, yeah, I got my, there it is. Let me show you something. Are that, you going to use one of those for your screen then? Yeah, um, I think I can use that same one for powering everything because I'm only at about an amp, amp and a half right now. And, even, with uh, your motor, even with your motors running, the motors are running. The motors are running off of this 12 volt buck converter oh. over here through the motor controller. Right. Yeah, 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 got you. Yeah, and those those motors currently aren't pulling too much. Of course, I haven't done a whole bunch of uh, research. I've only done the uh, no load, no load. They're a couple hundred milliamps a piece or something. You know, but as soon as I put load on them, I'm sure that'll change. Carl, where'd you get your wheels? What now? Where did you get your wheels? Um, uh, I got them from uh, Servo City. They're Actobotics. Um, see if I can look up, up a, a, a thing right fast. <clears throat> the other question I had for... Um, uh, all the Makita battery users, um, the like the old style Makita looks more like the wall that's got this big connector that sticks up into the thing. I'm assuming the ones that you have don't have that. Is that right? No, but you're correct. Okay. So they and it turns out that Makita, you know, they continue to innovate. I should be getting money for all this, like you know, advertising I do. But yeah. um, but like this is your standard 18 volt. This is a three amp, and they now have a six amp that's almost exactly the same size that I'm using. And then yeah. they have smaller ones. And there's also a 12 volt line that's considerably smaller. Um, they're almost like a miniature version of that, but 12 yeah. volt, I think they're a four amp. And then they've also got like a really high voltage one, like it's up in there to 50, 50 volts or something like that. If you want to go really fat, you know, big honking ones. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with those. And, and the, the ones you're looking at, they still make. It's just a different line. Okay. Yeah. 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 I have an old, um, I don't know, it's like a high speed grinder that um, uses a post that's similar to the, the Walt stuff. And, yeah. I'm uh, not sure why they, they switched that style, but that style with the post in the middle, they still have new tools with that in it. So there must be some reason for that difference. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, for those that are looking here, yeah, I'll put a... Yeah, the, the Makita battery, it flips around discharge forever, and I can throw it on the charger, and it, like a day, it's working again. I, I don't quite understand it. It's a, it's like a lifetime battery or something, you know? Yeah, Where the Walt ones, I've got three here on the floor that don't work anymore. I just need to throw out. They, they I put a, link in the chat to, put a link in the chat to the wheel. Okay. Oh, yeah. On there, so... It's got some heavy duty specs of which I, it's like crazy on the thing. It's got a cool mounting pattern on the thing that matches up to all the Actobotic stuff. Yeah. Um, and um, a good size reference on it. And I thought there was a, there was something else. And I, I bought, I bought one of the hub adapters and the hubs to connect it up to it. Um, and that seemed, they seem to be doing all right. And some crazy amount of, uh, I forget what the spec sheet on that is. But it, it held some crazy amount of weight and that kind of stuff, which I don't even – it doesn't really matter. But they but they seem really nice and well-made. And they look almost exactly like a Catherine wheel. I mean, you could, like, torture mice on them or something like that. Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, Harold, on your, on your five-volt regulator? Yes, sir. 
you're talking about um, at the moment you have maybe an amp or so you're going to pull from it. Yeah. Have you um, have you looked at the spec sheet on that to to make sure you understand how much power you can draw from what power supply, what voltage before you need to add a heat sink? Um, I did look at that, and they said anything above four amps, I need to start thinking about a heat sink on it. Cool. All right. That's what they said, and and um, and I need what I, the next thing I need to do probably I say one of the things I need to do is probably put something in line with the current coming out of that, and so I can get a current monitor on the thing, so I can sit there and watch it a little bit, see what's going on. I mean, I can do the same thing with my voltmeter and that kind of thing, but I, I might want to mount you know those uh one of those little displays that I can put in, put in line and stuff. It just stays on the robot. Yeah, who had the uh, who had the IN60 last week? I forget. Me. It's it actually Very called good, yeah. INA, INA260. Actually, it's INA260. An okay. Based on a TI INA260 uh, sensor. I've got. I'll I'll tell you about mine when we get to my stuff. But yeah, that's what I was using. An INA260. They're about ten bucks. So you know, you could do that, and then your robot could read the current that is drawing. Yeah, and put it up on my screen. Yeah, I've yeah. got it on the back. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I was looking at how I was, what all I was going to put on that screen because I got that. Uh, it's it's an incurses based GUI that's running on top of C sharp and .NET 5.0. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm, excuse me, but I got a lot of screen real estate there that I'd like yeah. to fill up with information, <laughs> and I can certainly do that. And with the Teensy. I should have enough stuff on the team to be able to read all that stuff and uh, run I2C in various places and that kind of stuff and read all that current and put it out. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know. So many options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Like I say, that's about all I have on the whole thing. And um, I'm doing, and uh, I'm when I'm twitching up, I'm doing all kinds of things. Like I was working on my. Uh, my mask thing. I finally got it where I can stick this in here and I got it cut out just well. It's, I love fusion 360 and I, it does really lots of fun things, but plastic doesn't always go where you want it to go. So even though you cut it just right until you play with your, and I got some Z banding going on there pretty badly. Um, a little sanding will take care of almost all that, but until you, until you figure it out, you know, how, how your printer, because uh, uh, plastic will shrink as it cools down. A uh, different plastic shrink at different rates, and even different brands, different colors of the same brand of plastic will shrink at a different rate because the coloring in it affects expansion and contraction, uh, <laughs> expansion on the heat and contraction when it cools down. Uh, so uh, most of the time, it's not enough to matter when I'm trying to cut something. So I can uh, let's see what have I got up. Can't tell what I'm going to. Yeah, I think there was a Seinfeld episode about that and shrinkage. Shrinkage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My name's not George, but sure, shrinkage. Um, but when I'm trying to cut, when I'm trying to put something together that, that fits really well like this, I'm going to paint this too as well. Um, it takes a little, you got to give yourself a little bit more than you thought you needed to give yourself. Uh, to make that happen. I actually tried to, I printed this three times before. This is the third print where I got exactly where it was acceptable. And of course, I know most of you have seen the eyes. I'm going to put the eyes back in here. I believe, yeah, I can get your opinion. Hold on. So, This is going to be the color of the base, kind of a uh, uh, a flat green. Alien green, I guess. An alien forest, green kind of thing. Forest green. Forest green. The uh, I've got uh, some bits and pieces to hold on to the Raspberry Pi and to hold on to the this. Uh, this is going to go in the back. This is going to be a button where it's got a joystick and that kind of thing on there. I'm going to paint these in this hammered uh, metallic gray. And on top of that green, which I think will be pretty cool. 
I, I would test that paint really carefully because I used exactly that paint, and sometimes it gets really drippy. I, I, I have I have test things. Okay. <laughs> and oh yeah, I have more test things, and some more test things, because yes, I had to print them several times, so I got the way I wanted to sizing of things right. Um, and then um, and then for the mask itself. I decided to go a little bronze age, age with it, and do this bronze color on it. And uh, again, with the hammered metal kind of thing, I thought it looked kind of neat with all those colors. And you're not going to go for the uncanny valley with like flesh colored paint. No, no, I, I just didn't. I wasn't feeling that. wasn't feeling that. And then the the, the, the the weird, the extra creepy factor, which is probably only going to be for me, is I found this can of paint. You notice it's clear, right? This kind of paint I found. Yeah, I haven't showed you the label yet. Uh, I found it. Okay, cool. So after I paint it with this and get a decent one, I'm going to paint it with this that is uh, glow in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how this is going to come out, but it sounded like, it looked like, and, and in my brain, my pre roller brown sounded like a whole lot of fun. So we're going to give it a try. It's some layering going on. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do. Yep, and I have, I have, a, I have a sneaky suspicion that along with those drippy things there, that I will more than likely put, I don't know, somewhere around a half a dozen of light coats of this paint on all of this, you know, the various pieces, before it gets screwed together again, to get a a, a nice good coating on it, and it the, the those layers will help fill in some of the the lining that the 3D print's gonna make show up soon as you. You don't see, I mean, you can see the lines on here, but you really don't see them until you hit it with a coat of paint. And then they're like, ah, oh, yeah, I just shined a big old flashlight on every one of those lines and then magnified it. And uh, so several layers of this uh, paint usually helps with all that. Usually helps. Not all. Usually Bondo helps. filler. Uh, yeah, I don't want to, you know, I thought about Bondo. I really did. You know, man, I'm like, I'm not going to Bondo all that. That's crazy. I ain't got, I ain't, who's got time for all that? And so, and so, actually, I probably do, but I'm I'm, I'm a little I, I want to go crazy a little bit, but then when I started talking to Bondo, some of it I do have some uh, some wood, yeah, wood wood color. Color. it's white, uh, plastic wood is what they call it, and uh, because I could not get this holder to come out worth a damn without some uh, uh, weirdness with the plastic not going where I want it to go on this face here so we're going to sand this down a little bit and then coat over it and see if i can get that uh, smoother before i go to do the painting on it and that i will do but doing that whole mask with bondo no man i'm doing that i ain't doing that Just, <laughs> you do you realize you can hire people to do your entire car so it can't be that hard <laughs> no there's there's a there's a there's there's it goes back to mary it comes back to that problem there's problems I have to solve and problems I want to solve and figuring out how to do the Bondo thing. is not a problem I want to solve. And I currently don't have to solve that to get this to where I want it to be. So yeah, that's where it comes down to. So the paints that are supposed to stick to plastic are there that are made to stick to plastic. Yeah. Every one of these, every one of these paints here sticks to multiple surface and it's supposed to stick to plastic and there's primer uh, embedded with it. With the stoleum, not all of them have the the combo paint and primer to them. Um, if it didn't advertise that on the bottle, I would have been picking up uh, plastic primer and spraying everything with that before I even started. Oh, okay. So it'll stick and, to ABS, PLA. Yeah, it know. didn't really specify what plastics it would stick or not stick to. Oh. But I figure at the very least, I hit it with the 220 or 320 grit before even because this surface here was down and it's really, really slick. So if I don't, uh, if I don't sand this with something, I guarantee you the paint's not sticking to it worth anything. Oh yeah. <laughs> the problems, we, the problems we have to solve and put ourselves into that, you know, I never once thought that I'd be worried about how do I paint plastic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could, you could have some re reaction like, you know, it turns into slime yeah or but, you know something like that so. yep and, and that's why i've got these uh that's why it's okay that i'd spent 
I don't know, a couple hundred grams of plastic printing all the other tests, all the other samples or other tires, you know, iterations. Because if they blow up, I don't care. Yep. You know. Okay. Yeah, Pearl. What cool. are you doing? All right. We'll come so here. let's bounce around a little bit. I think uh, John was uh, joined in the meeting next. So John, how about how about you? You have something to show on your progress? Aside from your fancy background. <laughs> Besides the fancy background, uh, basically I finished print and so. Now I'm starting to put the servos on the base. So eventually I'm, it looks like it's going pretty fast, but there's like three parts to put together. But they have these pin slide that you can basically put, uh, you know, you may be able to see the one pin there. So the contraption that, is blending into the background. Ah, okay, it figures. <laughs> like I said, a fancy background. <laughs> But yeah, probably you have to move or something. I don't know how the, yeah, the, the background integrates, but you'd have to you'd have to tell it that the robot looks like a person. So it, right. that's the problem, I guess. It doesn't know that. So, yeah. yeah. But anyway, so I hopefully next week I'll have a little more <laughs> along because as I said, it goes pretty fast together, the parts once you basically a snap and plug part type thing. So, so far I've been happy with the measurements for it. Cool. So I think the guy did a pretty good job. It's on, it's on Instructable and it's called that Gorilla Bot. I, I show you the video of that thing the other a couple of weeks back. So yeah, the print seemingly went well and it's uh, coming together slowly. So mm -hmm. that's about it for now. So we'll, we'll look for progress after Thanksgiving, that'll be good. Remind me, what is that going to be? Some sort of walking or crawling? Yeah, it's a four-letter walk. And basically, right. you have the, uh, it's similar to the strand beast in some ways. Only difference is instead of having a gear to run the thing, you basically have the two servos that have the legs on either side. And by your triangle being shorter, it moves the leg effectively. So it's somewhat like a strand beast, but a little variation of it. A strand beast, yeah. Cool. Boston Dynamics uh, spot on the you know, 125th scale. Yeah, it's more <laughs> on that line, but yes. <laughs> but lighter, <laughs> 3D printed. <laughs> so. Do we know anybody that's built a Boston Dynamics like type thing? I mean, personally, I've yeah. seen stuff on. You know, Bruton has done some, is trying to do some stuff and some other folks are doing some stuff. But do we know anybody personal is actually undertaking that? Because that's, that's a huge undertaking, right? Way oh, yeah. cool. Way well, cool. Yeah, there was this, I think he's an Arabic guy or something like that. I did see some YouTube videos and this one guy's built like five or six different variations, all, all um, you know, uh, 3D printed. And he keeps making them more and more complicated. I think the one that I remember seeing was a six-legged one, and you know they're about they're not as big as the Boston Dynamic, but they're like the size of a standard poodle, you know, and um, wow. pretty big and pretty sophisticated. I mean, they're I wish I don't ha any I have no reference to those anymore, but I remember seeing that a few months ago. Hmm. But but there's Maybe. some uh, just in the last month or so there was somebody who did a uh, like a 12-inch size. Uh, or a little smaller even to that that used the micro servos. So somebody mm -hmm. out there has some open source version um, that it's you could do. Like I need another project. I was just curious if we if we yeah. know anybody that's well, doing yeah. how they're getting along with doing that. The answer is, I think is no, but we're all aspirational in a way. But yeah, not that we need another project. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just looking through all my YouTube videos. Some videos of Boston Dynamics, the stuff they do, but. You know, they've got, I don't know how much those robots weigh. I'm, I'm guessing at least a couple hundred pounds. And, uh, you know, one one had a set of wheels on the legs and it would roll along, jump up on a metal table, jump off the metal table. I mean, you know, that's amazing that they can do that. That's, yeah, and um, at a couple hundred pounds, man, they need your type of work. You know, they need they need your type of... Uh, uh, Harold, you got the smoke. Harold, right? Harold, smoke. Harold, smoke. I got it. No, it's all right. That's just my uh, soldering iron yeah. up there. It's a brand, sure new it. brand new tip. Thank you very much for being alert. Thank you. Very <laughs>
But Carl, if you want to run that uh, link that I just sent, you can show it the baby version of this while I'm billing. It's oh, on the cool. okay. uh, I could try and share it, sure. Let's see if I get the right buttons going. So, baby. Um, is there a video on that page? Yeah, once you get there, you'll see the play. Okay. Oh. Maybe. Oh, when I need to go find the video. I'm sorry that I'm stepping on Doug there, but um, uh, do you guys know who uh, uh, Naomi Wu is? Yeah. The name sounds familiar, but... Yeah, on our YouTube channel, is called Sexy Cyborg. And now, I will tell yeah. you, most of her, I will tell you right now, most of her videos, I'm not sure whether there was technology involved in there, just because of uh, the look that she's going for. However, she actually knows a thing or two, and um, which is unfortunate. She dresses that way so she gets attention in China, but she shouldn't be dressing that way if she wants the attention of a tech tech folks. Exactly. But they, I'm, 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 I'm just I'm actually warning you because I've had friends of mine not even bother watching it because they see a picture of her and they they just dismiss her right out of hand and they should not do that. She went to in in China. She went to a robotic. Um, and I'll find a video and share it out because um, I just watched it just the other day. A robotic restaurant where there were no waiters and waitresses. You ordered your hamburger from a robot that made it. Uh, and you, you everything showed up at your table. One of them was like this big gantry king that came over and dropped it down like it was, you know, right out of uh, uh, Monsters Incorporated with the doors kind of thing. And let me go share it. I thought it was cool. And I, I'll, I'll go find it and share it out just I wanted to prep you by that because, again, I've had lots of friends that see the intro, see her, and goes, why am I watching this? My wife is going to get upset because I'm watching this. So, no, she actually knows what she's talking about. That's a possibility, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the articles, not the pictures, Harold. So, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> That's what I keep telling the wife. She still don't like it. So, okay, let's see if this works on the sharing screen. Of a video. Yeah, I think you're actually looking at a robot video, and it's really about robots and side boob. I mean, it's really, you know. <laughs> but she has just recently so increased bad. the size of that area, and side boob it was. Oh, there's it's there's all. Never mind. Uh, okay. All right, guys. This is real family friendly here. All right. I'm just, I'm just saying. Oh, it's all. It's all family friendly. I'm just saying that uh, she's. Uh, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> Nothing you wouldn't loop. see at a beach, right? Nothing you wouldn't see at a beach. There you go. That's a dainty little thing. Well, that's a smaller version of this, but same concept. I was actually there's one out there that's like a cat that's much more like the Boston robot, but this one has the demonstration of the you know the two servos with the leg bent. Versus the one. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool because it has, uh, I mean, only two servos per leg and it can still do this. So, yeah, that's yeah. sort of why I like about that. And that's why I sort of like that design better. But. Oops. Yeah, it looks like it's not on the back surface or maybe there needs to be something sticky on the feet. Seems like it slipped yeah, something, to, something to give it some gription, as my brother says. Gription. Yeah. Gription. <laughs> So is that actually coming across? Yeah. Reasonably well. I think my machine is slowing down. Pose. Yeah, it's, it's not too bad. It's coming across pretty good. All right. I mean, the frame rate ain't the greatest, but I mean, it's okay. If I step this up. All right. Uh, just so we need another another robot to chase down. I was thinking because I've seen one that's slightly larger than this that has the um, the independent joints for each leg instead of the this kind of action. Right, and there is uh, several out there. I haven't bumped right across the one I'm describing, but there's one that's like a cat that they use a laser to cut out the wood that was in in Strutable, the magazine like last year or the year before last. 
was pretty neat. And you can actually 3D print the parts on it that they have out there. I'll see if I can find that. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank you, John. So we're we're looking forward to seeing yours. You can uh, when you get your YouTube video, we're gonna we're gonna present that thing. All right. So let's see. So Murray, I think you you've been mentioning some uh, progress on the or John. Did, was there anything else you wanted to cover? No, not right now. So that fine. Cool. Um, yeah, well, I'm, uh, well, like, I, I'm happy to say my robot is not dead anymore. Um, and I do have to fry any Raspberry Pis. Um, it turns out that after considerably debugging, like tearing the robot apart, that somehow when I rewired it, I was getting a five volt line into the 3.3 volt logic line. And so my I squared C bus was not working. But I have happily, no, let's see if I pick it up. I think you guys have seen this thing before, but Basically, it's now running again, up and running. And the nice thing, I, I'm not going to take it off, but this whole front sensor, uh, app, the whole front bumper, which has these little uh, micro switches for the uh, polycarbonate bumper, the side center and oblique infrared sensors, and the camera, all of that now is on a separate um apart from the camera, it's all on its own uh, IO expander, which is a little tiny microprocessor. And so there, between that whole front sensor apparatus, there's only four wires now going to the robot, power and uh, SDA and SCL connectors. So it's all I squared C, the whole front of the robot is. And that's all working now and it works pretty well. Um, I'm, I did get the two INA 260s in line with my motors now and i've got a test script so that when the motors run um, i'm getting current power and voltage off that off of each of those sensors although i think i might have blown one of them or something because it always shows about 500 and some odd milliamps whereas the new one doesn't so i've got another one coming in the in the post um but i'll basically have current sensing on the motors um so that's all coming right. along do those things do those things only measure instantaneous or do they have some kind of averaging function built in? Well, the actual chip is actually called an INA260. And on the Adafruit site, they have a link to the TI chip and it runs in different modes. And um the default you can have it on a spot check, but the default that the Python uh, library that's being used is continuous mode. So you basically is it just gives you a stream. I think it's running every 1.1 millisecond or something like that. Um, and you can even change that. There's quite a lot of configuration on it, but it's basically just reading continuum. And, and if you think about it, since I'm not really concerned about the speed, since this is current sensing on a motor, um, it could be you know 10 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds. It's not gonna be critical. So what I'll do is probably run it on an interrupt or something like that. And uh, either that or I've got my control loop and just have it every loop. It'll just see if it's looking like it's driving too hard. Um, but that's all working. Um, I did get the BNO 088 up and running. That's now, that's now on the top of the stem there. Got a mm -hmm. little green light. And that has the same basic interface Python-wise as the BNO 055. But I haven't quite got to that yet because, of course, I've been getting the robot back and running, and that was only a few days ago. On an entirely different front, um, this is a NanoPi Fire 3. It's an 8 processor, 1.4 gigahertz, Raspberry Pi compatible, kind of. And that's the part I'm a bit disgruntled about. This thing runs at 64 degrees Celsius in idle <laughs> mode. It, it runs pretty <laughs> idle. Yikes. Yeah, and idling. Now, the one thing I found is I've managed to get um, Ubuntu. I think it's Ubuntu. Yeah, it, no, it's a Debian Linux on here with Python, everything up and running. And I plugged in my Square C uh, devices and tried it out. And it turns out that on a Raspberry Pi, the I squared C bus zero is the bus you don't touch, and and bus number one is where everything shows up. For some reason, whoever designed this puts everything on bus one, and when you plug an I squared C device in, your device shows up on bus zero. 
Mm. And I don't know how to fix that because that means that all of the devices I've got, all these Pimeroni devices are showing up on the wrong bus and therefore the Python libraries don't find them. And I, I think I was trying to dig into the libraries to see if you could switch which bus was being used and that's possible. But right now, this goes along with these as being very small doorstops. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this. This was meant to be the, the processor for my next um, mechanum wheeled robot because it's got eight processors. And apart from the battery life being probably rather low, it looked promising. And it still does if I can figure out how to swap the I squared C bus zero for one and one for zero. But the one thing I've read about I squared C is they say in almost all the documentation, don't mess with bus zero. So I don't know when you plug a device in and it shows up on bus zero, that seems kind of screwy. And I have realized a long time ago, as you guys probably have, is that this comes from China, from a Chinese company. And if you go on their forum, they have, they have a forum and there's hundreds and hundreds of messages all unanswered. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. I'm not expecting to get a whole lot of help from the Chinese company in getting this running. It's a very nice little device. Um, I might use it for something. I don't know what. Um, but if I can't figure out how to swap the I squared sweep uh, I squared C buses, I probably can't use it for anything, unfortunately. And apart from that, I think that's about it. Oh, I sold my car, so I've got cash. Oh, yeah. time for shopping. Yeah. Just in time for all the sales. Yeah, Black Friday's coming up. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you that $148 TV I got from Walmart on the Black Friday deal. <laughs> it's pretty good, man. The I will tell you that the, the lighting going across from one edge to the other, it's a bit spotty at times. But at this point, once I kick everything on and going, I can't tell and I don't care. It looks good. I don't need another TV, Harold. No, I'm not, you know, I'm just saying. I'm, in fact, I don't even watch TV on my TV. It's all YouTube and Hulu and, yeah. oh, uh, Disney Plus has a series out right now about the right stuff. They are uh, the Mercury 7 folks. Yeah. And, um, they took some, se I'm pretty sure they took some severe liberties in a bunch of the conversations, but they're hitting all the high historical points. So mm. it's pretty good. Wife's enjoying it, so. I got I got the WAF, the wife acceptance factor on that, so you know it can't be too bad. <laughs> there you go. That's cool. All righty. Mr. Ray, how about you? I have um swapped out. I was gonna make a video and take some pictures, but it got dark and it's raining here, so <laughs> uh, maybe next time. <laughs> yep. Anyway, um swapped out the motors on the on the push mower. Uh, the smallest one, and um, you know that I'm using the um, the basic micro uh, motor driver for that, so it's it works you know a little bit differently than uh, you know it's it's got its own PID loops in it, and you can you know run some code, and it'll it'll basically generate your PID coefficients for you if you want them, and all that stuff so that's that's kind of different or you know at least different than the way i used to drive it um it works pretty good um just on a single battery the the motors are kind of a strange voltage they're 22 volt motors so i could probably run them on you know two 12 volt batteries and just not push it you know to 100 percent duty cycle or something and kind of have the equivalent of 22 volts um i don't the traction on the tires that I have is not very good. They were lawnmower tires with like a diamond print and it's not very deep. And I need something like with a, a cross hatch or cross tread pattern, almost like, you know, grooves perpendicular to the motion of the tire to actually grab the grass. And, um, so, uh, the motors are a little bit heavier than the toy motors that, um, that I had, I noticed on on some of the areas, it would just spin the wheels, and um, so I think if I uh, either put grooves in the, you know, kind of like a perpendicular cut around the circ circumference of the wheel, it'll actually grip, 
Um, also went to Harbor Freight and bought some that um, they have kind of an offset. It's an offset uh, tread pattern that looks like cleats, but they're not lined up. They're, you know, it's, you have a bump on one side and you have a bump on the other and it, you know, goes that way around the whole tire. And, um, those may work. It's, it's pretty easy to swap out wheels now and just see what, what works better. Um, and I've been working on um, the big mower. Um, this is the riding mower. And I had, um, I was trying to figure out a way to stick an encoder on it. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that. Anyway, so this is a, it's a threaded rod that comes out of a right angle. I guess I gotta un unconnect, disconnect some things here. I can't get it in the it needs to go more to your left as well. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I just disconnected all the wires on the on the shaft encoder. Um, anyway, so that's shaft encoder on the end of the shaft, and that's about the only place I can put it. I tried to figure, you know, do something in here in the gearbox. The back of the motor is sealed, so you can't, you know, attach anything on the back of the motor. Um, I can't get this uh, set screw out in the front of the motor. I thought maybe I could extend the shaft out here and put something there. Anyway, so it's going to have to be at the end of the shaft, which isn't ideal, but uh, I think it will it will work okay. Um, and that's to um, there's a lever on the transaxle that controls um, direction and speed. If you pull it all the way up, um, that's as fast as you can go forward. And kind of in the middle is you know your your stop. Um, and then if you push it all the way you know down to the full extent of the travel, uh, it'll go in full reverse at you know the fastest speed. So. Um, I, you know, it's it's just going to be kind of pulsed to position and then left, um, you know, for a, either forward speed or, or reverse speed. Um, so it's not going to be on a lot of the time. And um, I've got another servo that's actually going to push on the combination brake clutch. Um, and that that requires very little force. It's like you know you can easily move it with two fingers. And if I if I pull the pedal all the way back, it engages the belt that drives the transaxle. And if I push it down just a little bit, it engages the brake that's on the transaxle. So um, anyway, I was going to use one of these. I think these are thirty kilogram centimeter. You know, higher powered servos. So, anyway, it runs on 6.8 volts. So I'm going to have to do something there. Because if you run it on less voltage, you don't get that torque. Well, that's, that's going to draw some current, too, right? I mean, you think the smaller ones draw some current. That, that sucker. Oh, it's yeah. Got torque. It's, the torque is coming from somewhere. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, just as long as I can get a source that's the right voltage, um, you know, the the drive, you know, the, the current on the drive pin is nothing. So, um, but yeah, so, and hopefully I can do a video about that one too. So at least, you know, showing it, you know, in RC mode and the RC mode that I have now is actually, um, uh, it's the LoRa 32U4, so it's based on the you know the 32U4 processor, but it's got a LoRa transceiver on it. Um, got it from Banggood. Um, the range is incredible on it, and you know I can even reach areas that you know I couldn't haven't reached with anything else. It'll go, you know, on the other side of a pretty good sized metal building. It'll go all the way to the front of my property. Um, so I think I'm going to, I'm going to stick with anything RC related now is, is going to be a LoRa, you know, LoRa radio just because they work so well, um, and have really good, you know, good penetration. So anyway, that's what I've been up to.
That's pretty cool. Yep. Yep. Let's see. Mr. Chris, how's it going in the Northeast as we, as we get down to the line following cluster of fierce competitors? Uh, okay, all right. Well, it's um, I made a little bit of progress, not a not not a lot. Let me just. He's holding um, back on us. Let's not be fooled. <laughs> no, no, actually, uh, it's it's not a ton of progress, honestly. Uh, I'm quite uh, quite disappointed. Let me share. Um, you know, if he's he's doing good when he wants to make a bet just before the the, the games, you know. <laughs> yeah, this. I'm I'm quite frankly a little bit uh, scared by this this whole arrangement, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why just right there, that's why. So. I figure so, I'll probably go into one of the local horse racing places in Wellington and find that Chris has actually got like a fifty dollars down on his robot. You know. Yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. Bookies that'll take bets on anything. Yeah. Yeah, that should be. Yeah, we should. We should. We should talk about that. We should. I love. We should play some bets. Um, <laughs> there's still time. <laughs> They'll time to tweak the rules a little bit and allow for some excitement. Um, so this is what I showed last time. I'm just going to use this again because it's it's just it's just easier than uh, letting it run. But but I finally managed to get over that gap in E2. Okay, so that's really the only progress. That's where I was stuck. I can get to this point very quickly, and then I was stuck. So now I can get, you know through e3 and then over the gap in e2 and you know kind of keep going and there's still some other issues i gotta tackle now i'm not terribly happy about how i managed to get over the e2 gap you know i'm effectively making use of the knowledge i have of the course let's just put it that way right i know what the course looks like i kind of know sort of where i am at that point and, and I know what, you know, uh, course feature I'm going to encounter here. And therefore, I sort of apply actually a very simple strategy to make it over the gap. So not sophisticated at all. I mean, it's literally, I'll be honest, it's literally just doing a hard-coded maneuver. That's, that's you know, I, I found I got I to gotta just make progress and get it, get it at least completed. So I'm doing... Once I hit that intersection, which you know I can detect when I'm at that intersection, uh, I switch temporarily to a different approach, and that is, you know, go forward by a certain amount, make a turn, you know, go forward, make another turn, another turn, and then and then you know, by that you know after those couple hard coded uh, fixed duration, you know movements and turns i basically end up in somewhere in e1 or close to e1 right and that's where the line is there again and then i just go back to my default logic of actual line following right so that's that's how i'm tackling it right it's it's just a hard coded you know it'd be i guess in the terminology of uh rodney brooks that would be called the ballistic behavior right you just kind of once once you sense what you're looking for, you just kind of pull the trigger on a on a sort of behavior or on a movement. And once you start, you know, you're just gonna finish it. And that's what I'm doing. And yeah, so I'm taking advantage of the fact that the course is known and the fact that you know it's very predictable, right? There's no noise in the sensors and et cetera. So that's how I can get away with um you know, doing a fixed maneuver at that point, because I always, you know, when I stop here somewhere near E3 or, or you know, at that intersection E4, I always stop at the same place, same angle, right, same orientation. And so I can get away with doing a fixed maneuver and make it from, you know, E4 to E1. And then I keep going with line following. So not proud of it. It's I'm not proud of it, but but you know I, I just I kind of ran out of patience with myself to do anything well again, so I got I'm doing it the you know the simplest approach and 
I'll probably do the same thing with those other obstacles that I still have to face. And then, and then if there's time remaining, well, then I can refine the logic and see if I can come up with something more, you know, robust and more elegant. Question on that. Uh, I see you're uh, sort of taking a shortcut across some of those patterns. Is that legal? I mean, especially- Now that's, see, that's why I've highlighted them, right? That's, are you talking about the ones that are highlighted in red or yeah. any other patterns? Yeah, well, especially the one that's at uh, B6, the one down there at the bottom. B6, yeah, that's why it's highlighted because no, I know I'm not gonna get away with that. I know I need to fix it. Anything in red, you know, I know I can make it across right now, right at B6, but I know that that's not, that's not, that's not good enough. So I, I gotta fix B6, I gotta fix F3, okay. right? And, yep. and so I'm still working on that. Okay. So in E2, you just didn't take the leap of faith and use like last X or, um, you know, to get across the gap, you're doing, you're doing something else. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't, can you say that beginning part one more time? Okay, for E2, um, you're not using like your last, you know, uh, I, I call it my X value, you know, just a, a point that you think you need to steer to if you don't have anything else. You're doing something other than that, right? Yeah, I'm just, because I, the, the thing is, my logic got confused somewhere in E3, right? The 90 degree angle in E3. And so I never made it all the way, you know, to that spot between E2 and E3 yeah. in, 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 you know, being aligned properly, right? So I just, I just sort of again, ran out of patience and said, you know what? I'm in E4. I know I'm in E4. I know what orientation I'm in. I'm going to do a hard coded maneuver. I just got to get through this. That's, that's it. You know, I, yeah. because so, and then, like I said, if, 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 if time's remaining, maybe I do something more elegant. I have been drawn. I find myself getting drawn more and more into doing this with machine learning or, or, you know, with a neural net, which again, I probably won't have time, but, but, but this is this is really prompting me to to read up on it, and I've been watching tons of YouTube videos, and I've concluded a convolutional neural net is kind of what you would what you would use in this kind of situation. Right. Um, you know, it seems all pretty straightforward in TensorFlow. Again, I, I don't know if I would be able to do this because now, how would I interface all that with the Java in processing? I mean, that's 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 can of worms after can of worms. So I, I definitely won't be able to do it in this environment, but but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna keep reading up on on TensorFlow and neural nets because I do wanna know how to how to solve this kind of problem, you know, with a, something like convolutional neural net. And, um, you know, so to get to that point, right, to leave time for doing that, I'm gonna have to take some, you know, shortcuts, so to speak. Um, yeah, yeah in this um, and, and, you know, I'm just going to do it uh, in a real simple fashion. And, you know, I'm still within the bounds of the contest, right? The map is given, make use of the information that's given. And what, you know. Yeah. yeah so, uh, so I just want to rewind a little bit there, Chris, just to make sure I heard something right. You tell me, this is what I heard. I'm working on a robot. I'm trying to get things done and I ran out of patience. I've never heard such a thing. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask Carl when when you were doing all your simulations, did you get kind of frustrated with the the challenge course? I mean, I think I would have pulled my hair out if uh, you know if I did all the work you did. And well, I, I mean, of course I did, but the thing was that uh, you know one reason it took me three years was that I was I was not putting in more than a couple hours a week for much of the year. So, you know, I, I spent an hour and a half of remembering what I was doing the prior month and then or the prior week, and then I'd get 30 minutes of progress and I'd park it. So, oh, so yeah. it, it was a lot easier to not get bored on it because it was like a new time every time, but progress was really slow. Yep. Yeah, I think the, uh, 
the first the frustration with this course i can definitely relate to that i'd say it was the last but time we, we actually ran the real course um i had tried so many different things and i had a just to get the thing to run reliably i had to take out all the logic changes and go back to kind of a brute force method and i said okay it's either i'm either gonna you know come in three, third out of three or uh you know maybe somebody else will have a worse time than i had but, it, but apparently that's what happened because i came to say ray I'll, I'll tell you though i'll tell you though two things and, and the first was that by the time we finally had that contest, right? Because I did it in what was it, eight minutes with three restarts. So yeah. it failed, but it it was really close. So I'm confident that that approach, if I would have had a robot with encoders on the wheels, right? And if I would have maybe increased the sample rate and taken smaller bites, I know that it could have done it consistently. But uh -huh. but we had the contest and it did what it did, it parked it. But I'll right. tell you, this has been really, this has been really interesting session now with our contest coming up on the 12th, because I, I took a very different approach that last go around, right? It was straight machine vision and I was uh, doing feature extraction for lines. So I was identifying line segments. Right. And then with those, I was figuring out which line segments were closest to the nose of the robot. And I was setting endpoints. So it was really deep logic, but it was pretty robust, right? If you could yeah. get a good CV yeah. going. I, I started, I started actually, I had, I pulled some Java code from somewhere to do a linear regression, trying to fit the line and some of the edges. So I, I dabbled with that actually a little bit, abandoned it pretty quickly. Um, another thing I tried, but what I'm going to abandon is, is I tried, you know, I, I wanted to be able to sort of, in a, in a fairly generic fashion, detect these, what I would call landmarks, right? Like the acute angle or 90 degree bend, or again, this E3 kind of special situation there. I wanted a flexible way of detecting, you know, the fact that I've reached that point. And, and so what I, the thing I tried, a little bit inspired, I guess, by Neuronet, but, but, but really different in a way is I decided, okay, what if I, what if I remember? What if I take samples of what my senses are seeing at a certain place? And by sample, I mean I just remember sort of the metadata, right? How many edges in each line sensor? Where where I think the center of the line is? How many black pixels? How many white pixels? So there's a couple sort of pieces of metadata that I'm extracting all the time. So I decided for every sort of special place, like the acute angle take a couple snapshots, right? Just move the robot a little bit, take another snapshot, turn it a little bit, take another snapshot. So take 10 snapshots near, you know, or around this sort of special place, call it a landmark, okay? Do that for a couple such landmarks. And now every simulation step, take a snapshot of what I'm currently seeing and try to find which landmark yeah is the closest match right and and each landmark itself consists of multiple snapshots right so you just kind of i have the way of sort of evaluating how good you know how different sort of my snapshots are the logic all worked the code worked but it turns out with that simplistic approach that just too many times you have like multiple landmarks and i'm in some place and i'm getting a good match right with multiple landmarks I wasn't able to distinguish. Yeah. So it, sound, it, it seemed like a good idea initially, and it didn't take too long to implement the logic. I'm a little slow with this whole Java thing. It's slowing me down a little bit. But, you know, the code's working, but it just, again, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't performing as well as I, I hoped. And and that would have at least given me a flexible way of kind of recording these landmarks and it you know i would have felt better about it it's kind of seemed elegant but it's just not doing the job and so yeah. Yeah. i gotta i gotta do it a simpler way you know so you know um, but i really wanna i really wanna you know so i he, yeah, i heard what you just said carl you know so you you did it the computer vision sort of manual feature extraction kind of way right but that's what the convolutional neural net is doing for you right so you let yeah. it figure out 
it, it's going to figure out, oh, edge detection comes in handy for this kind of, to detect this sort of pattern, right? So it's, 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 it's learning all these filters that you manually apply, right? You would, you would do a convolution thing with a, with a kernel that ends up giving you edge detection, right? It's a simple example. The convolution of neural net figures that part out for you, right? But just, but just so I really want to try that it. out. I really want to try that out. I need to find a way to sort of, yep. you know, take take pictures as I'm driving through. I, I'm gonna do this with TensorFlow. It just seems real, real simple. Now again, I don't know if that's a dead end, because again, perhaps the data just does lend itself to accurate, you know, classification of the pattern. Because if it's too similar, right? You're not gonna get a. You're not gonna. You know, if there are not enough distinguishing features there in some of these, uh, you know, as I call them, landmarks, right? Then um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get a 55% match with one and the 45% match with the other, and you know, you just don't really know which way. What about at. adding, uh, Chris? What about adding some more sensors to help you? Uh, you know, discriminate the, the different features. I, I sort of found myself doing that. Yeah, I suppose I could do that. So with my simple, with my simple sort of feature comparison logic, you know, I suppose if I added more senses, maybe it'll, maybe it'll work better. I guess I could I could give that another shot before I completely dismiss it. Um, but I feel like again, what I'm gonna do with the rest of the time here, I'm gonna take a dead simple approach for these remaining issues that I need to tackle, right? Those red circles, I, I did E2 now. And then, you know, then, I, then I'll work on my plan B, which is the neural net, but uh, that's, you know, well, probably won't make it. it in time for the course. You can so do it, it's just a matter of uh, labeled samples, that's all, just a few labeled samples and you can train a neural net, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't have any experience in that area at all. And, you know, I do know it's going to boil down to, right, how good your data is. And, and so, I, you know, it could very well be a dead end. Chris, have you heard of the, the donkey car stuff? Yes, yes. So that could be, that could be a source of inspiration. Because um, that's exactly what the donkey car does. Yeah, I know, but what they're doing is what they're doing, I believe, is they're letting the neural net uh, determine, you know, how hard you steer. I, I don't think I want that. I think I want I want the remaining control over my actual speed and steering. I just want it to tell me, right? Am I facing a line that's just straight ahead, or you know, am I at a bend? Am I at a 90 degree corner? You know, am I in some other weird situation? I, I'd rather sort of tell me just that. And me, you may not figure out how to navigate efficiently a 90 degree bend. I think I can, I can figure that out. I just need to reliably determine sort of where I'm at. Oh yeah. Yep. The, the donkey car recorded steering and speed like per image. So when it took like maybe 10,000 images on a much more simple course than this thing is. But um, it did, you know, the, like the things that Doug and I did, we were able to, and um, I forgot what the, the British guy, or, oh God, what's his name? Um, there was another guy that did it. Um, oh, Ross, Ross Melbourne? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he was, you know, Ross, I think, probably did the best with it and had a platform that would go very fast. And he would he had trained it on a course, and then we started removing things from the course to see when it would fail. And it worked very well. And, and his, I don't think I could have driven his platform as fast as he was driving it around that course. So, um, it was pretty impressive. You could you could try that. It's it's not too difficult. But again, I guess it's just your preference and how much time you got. <laughs> yeah, and again for this for this contest, definitely not going to happen, right? Because yeah, you're going to have to interface all that stuff with the processing environment. And I, I I searched for has anybody integrated TensorFlow into this? It gets all a bit convoluted. 
you know, yeah. TensorFlow is in Python, and this is in Java. It's not even pure Java. It's processing. So it's, it's a, it can be a can of worms to to bridge those together. And so it just, I, yeah. but separately from the contest, I I I I, I want to learn how to how to do this with the neural net. So and it's just inspired me to sort of figure that out. And Chris, are you familiar with Jython? No. There is actually a very, it's, it's a, it, when it first started as a project, it's pretty rough, but um, I've, I've been, as you know, I've been learning Python and I'm a Java programmer. And the state of the Jython project is pretty good right now. It's basically a Python integration in Java. So you can basically parse within the JVM or within the JDK, I should say, Python code and actually run it on the JVM. So it's a really tight integration of Java and, and Python, which would be an app. Processing that. supports Python, but oh. I don't know what that does for you, but they do have a, a Python uh, front end or whatever you call it, interpreter. But then you probably can't use your library anymore because your <laughs> library is in, in Java, right? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And besides, though, a lot of the... Uh, application a lot of lfs is built into your your sketch but you know the thing i've done with processing is it's pretty easy to do serial to talk serially to things and really i i started with a network interface so that's another possibility you know tcp ip right i was thinking that i, I could you that's know not, uh, you could do it in some other environment and then have them to communicate some client server approach which right yeah. But you know that it takes a, 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 it would take a few days. I think that's what it took me to kind of work through that just to get a simple client server. But that's how LFS was going to be structured. But the performance hit was too great, so I decided to abandon that. But I did have it running in a client server model where the where let me think I, the, the server actually handed off the sensor data to the client. So the server was taking care of all the image processing and all the uh, you know, visual stuff and just giving you the, the sensor data. But anyway, just kind of like your program interface, you get the sensor data, you tell it how fast you want to go and how fast you want to turn, that sort of thing. Uh, Ron, I just looked it up, and it turns out that processing actually uses Jython behind the scenes. So you do get a low level Python interface from Jython inside of processing inside of Java. So Chris, it's possible. I mean, you might have to go right down to the bottom to get to it, but you probably want to do it. Yeah, but I don't know if the TensorFlow and all the libraries and all the dependencies, right? They all have to be pulled into this, right? So it's not just a matter of writing a piece of Python logic, right? That's not what what I want to do is I need to be able to pull in the TensorFlow libraries right. and all its dependencies. And I have a feeling that's not going to work with the way processing does things. Mm -hmm. And unless you go the client server route, like, like Ron suggested. And anyway, again, I, there's no time for all that. So, um, so I'll, 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 keep it, I'll keep it that simple and, you know, and then, uh, next, next contest, I'll, I'll do some, some machine learning stuff. There's no army coming in second. Uh, you will. Uh, the rate he's going, he might be doing pretty good. Yeah, so. I spent I spent a few days kind of reworking my controller, and I think okay, I I like it. It's a little better, but it, I think it's probably slower. But I, I'm liking the code better. I think my uh, my ability to recognize features is okay enough i can get through the course uh but i'm falling short of your 20 seconds to that first intersection <laughs> i actually i could show that let's see if i can show you what i'm doing hey ron what is what does your sensor array look like oh you can yeah just have a look i'm not, i can't guarantee i'm i'm using them all i barely use some of them oh, okay. okay let's see if i uh, i think i may have scrambled up my you're not going to open the kimono all the way Okay. Let's see. Okay, that's not right. Hang on. I'm looking a little con okay, that is correct. Okay, let's see. All right. This might be my sensor array. So yeah, I guess what you'll see that's different. I think I had my although I don't think this is that beneficial. 
Oh, we're kind of getting rain. Is that, can you hear me okay? Boy, it's noisy against the, uh, there's probably a lot of uh, noise. Maybe it's being filtered. Well, anyway, uh, so here's my controller. And as you can see, I've added uh, sort of some counts on my detects as far as how many uh, features have been detected. And that just kind of helps me see how things are going as far as false detection of features and that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, my goal is to be able to instantaneously detect features, but sometimes I end up running sort of an integrator kind of effect uh, to filter the, the inputs. But uh, let's see, so here's my current robot. Let's see, I, I'll run it over to this marker, which is the, the Chris, Chris measuring stick of 20 seconds. Let's see, I'll, oh, and I did, uh, I'll show you a command. Because I have a parameter editor up often and it kind of blocks out the buttons. I did add a key for doing this uh, go to marker, which I have an O key. I'll show you. That's just a few lines of code, if I didn't mention that before. But OK, let's see how this thing does. So yeah, 24 seconds. And you can see I'm pretty clean. Um, but uh, you know that's all good. But my time isn't, uh, you know, Chris has got me beat. Now here, I, one thing that I just did is I finally implemented a uh, is a, what I call a left acute, so I can run this backwards. So anyway, so I can run forward and backwards over this this chunk of stuff here. But um, did I? Oh, it ran quicker. The reverse, huh? Oh, wonder why that is. Anyway, um, what was that? Oh, what's that? I thought I heard somebody. Oh, anyway, let's see what else. Oh, I'll show you this button because I just felt it came in handy. So my my code for the go marker. Uh, let me stop my program here. Um, so under the key, let's see, user key. Yeah, so I wrote uh, just this code and I, I did put the comment here so I'd remember what was happening. But basically I went and looked to see what happens when you press the go marker button. So whoever wrote that code, I just took their code and I copied it here. And uh, it seems to work pretty good. But uh, I just found that to be real handy to have that key because I, I really like that feature. Now, I, I was going to talk about another feature, but really, if you use the debug mode, I guess, and a breakpoint, that's probably as good as uh, what I did, and I'll show you that one. But maybe there's no point. Hey in guys, it. we're having really bad windstorms here. I don't, I don't know if you're going to get any of that sooner or later, but it just oh. broke some patio furniture. So wow! So you're north. Where where exactly are you, Ray? I'm like 17 miles north of Melissa. Wow. So I just, just hit here as Ron was starting, and this is uh, Heber and Josie. Yeah. Very strong winds. Yeah, it's coming down pretty good here at uh, Coit and Parker, too. Oh, you know, hey, I might, uh, we have an umbrella sticking out of a table. I'm going to go see if I need to pull that. So <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sure me. your yeah. screen, Ron. Be sure your screen okay. will come oh, yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah, will do. Yeah. Oh, by the way, though, let's it see. Oh, big here's my little thing. That, uh, oops. Before oh, come I back to you, Ron. Take care of your umbrella. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Let's undo this. Okay, bye. bye. By the time right. Ray gets out there, though, it may be gone because it's looking like it's going pretty fast. <laughs> I don't know. It was thrashing on my window for about five minutes. I could hardly yeah. hear anything. There's oh. kind of a thing that happens in the Wellington area here, which is that almost all of the big storms tend to loft at least one or two of those uh, backyard trampolines. Mm -hmm. they, they basically lift off the ground and go blowing down the street. Right. Uh, well, it's possible here because yeah, what I'm seeing is red on the. You know, there's one channel I tend to watch for weather, and they, the 8.2 channel, and yeah, it's showing the lines, and it's basically yeah, going through here right now. So, are you guys getting a hurricane or just a storm? It's just red, cold. heavily cold. raining rain. Mm -hmm. Whoa, there are like Murray, there's like three different fronts if you look at the map of the United States, and there's three mm -hmm. different fronts, and they always like the apex where they meet is right over Dallas, and they're always coming in from different directions. So you never know what's gonna happen, but it's gonna be interesting. 
because there's one front fighting with another, then another one comes in behind it. Now, so. yeah, we're just looking at the at the weather map here, and it looks at just after it hits Dallas, the front, the front splits. The front is predicted to split into like, you know, it's like one front coming in, and it's predicted to split to do one of these numbers. You want to share your map so y'all you know, everybody can see it? Because in case I missed hurry. this, I'm just on weather. I'm on weather.com. That's ah. like, Com and said, Give me the radar. There right. was a tornado wet warning for Denton County where I live until 8 15. So that was 45 minutes ago. Oh, well. So that might explain the sirens I heard out about 20 minutes back. But nowadays, <laughs> I was like, it's it's a skinny storm. It's getting past us pretty quick. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. scooting fast based on the loop I'm seeing on the radar. Ron, did you get some rain? <laughs> yeah, you notice uh, my sweatshirt is off uh, <laughs> and uh, got soaked, and I and I wet my pants. It looks like. Oh, a wait a minute! <laughs> you were saying your pants got wet, and you wet. Oh, your that's pants. that's probably it. Okay, I was pretty uh, nervous out there, but you're probably right. It was the rain. All right, so Ron, I think you want to just pick up where you was. Oh, okay. I don't know how much more there is. Just let's let's see. There was you had one other button or something, and then we can yeah we can drop over to Jean. Okay. But, okay. Oh, so yeah, the the thing that. Uh, but whether this is handy or not, when I recognize a pattern, uh, I did add this little method just to freeze the controller, and the, the trick there is. There is a variable called sim. Oh, am I presenting? Yes. Okay. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. There's a variable called sim freeze, and you set that to true. But the thing that you've got to do inside your controller is you need to set the uh, request step to false. And I, I can send. I could put this in an email or whatever to the list. Yeah, this is very handy. I, found, I, I ended up doing more or less the exact same thing. Oh, okay. Very handy. Okay. To freeze. Yeah. To freeze it right where you are. And that way you can see exactly what your uh, what your sensors are seeing, you know. So in other words, the idea is if you're if you have something triggered, let's see if I can do that. Uh, hang on, I'll just whisk up here. Uh, come in here. Yeah. So right here, I'll. Uh, oh, I already managed to have that on my uh, clipboard. So here. This is uh, my acute angle detector, which isn't really it, but it's getting detected somewhere else and setting a variable. But so I'll run the, uh, so now that I've added this freeze right here after, you know, my pattern detector has picked up the acute angle left or right side, mm. uh, acute angle, and I'll, we'll just show that in. in. Okay, so now I'll say go and uh, bang, it stopped right there. And so uh, my console will tell me uh, program generated sim freeze. I just added that, you know, little bit of stuff in there. But anyway, so here we are. So right where, uh, you know, where I've detected the acute angle, we can see what the pattern was that I saw. And it turns out, uh, not sure exactly, I'm probably am looking at uh, linear sensors that are lined up this way and probably cross sensors, maybe my arc sensors, I can't remember which ones, but some combination generates a unique pattern there. And uh, that, that seems to work fairly well. So but anyway, if, you set, if you set request step or sim step to false, not you right now, the way you are, you can't move the robot, correct? Oh, well, you know, that's a good question. I, unless I went it looks like and you can move the robot, right. but your sensor, your highlighting won't update, right? Uh, no, it should. Um, let's see. Whoops. Oh, my, I have it in time warp. Let me do it without time warp. So I'm going to just say go uh, nine. And I, I think it will because I'm not frozen. I don't keep hitting that, uh, that break. So there I hit it. Let's see if I actually can step. Yes, I can. Oh, and by the way, the way I do my sensors is I call, I separate out my, my sensor detection of line stuff as a separate method. And I call that, uh, <clears throat> let's see, I make sure that gets called whether the controller is active or not. So if you'll see, see. right now, the controller is on, <laughs> say I turn it off, bam. Okay, now watch as I drag the robot. 
my sensors are alive. So in other words, what I'm doing is every draw, I'm, I'm calling my methods that, that take care of uh, figuring out, you know, what, where the line intersections on the sensors are. So I don't, you know, like the simple bot did that all in the controller. Well, uh, so, and the way I do that is there's a method that gets called uh, from the, let's see, user miss, miscellaneous, every draw, every screen draw, uh, let's see, user, in the documentation, it'll tell you about this, but every screen draw, it uh, calls this user miscellaneous update. And so I take that and I quickly vector it out to a user uh, controller update sensor display. And I'm just going to right click and go to the, that declaration. So that's in my controller stuff. And so it's in there where I go ahead and, well, actually, then I call updates sensors. That's my stuff that actually uh, figures out you know, where lines are intersecting and colors the sensors for me. So. The cool thing is that's happening every screen draw, whether the controller is enabled or not. So that's a handy thing to break that out, uh, so that you have that alive. You know, while the uh, you know while the things, because that way you can drag the thing around. And for example, I have a stain detector, uh, and you'll see over next to that uh, bar graph, uh, next to the the uh, the. Uh, whatever the heck you call it, the uh, ch chart, the, the uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm having a senior moment here, the scrolling oh. chart. <laughs> anyway, that there it is by my mouse cursor. See, so it recognizes when there's a stain, but also I do try to discern, you know, what's line and so forth. And I think I'm doing that, but here it's not working too good. You can see there it's picking up the stain on that, that sensor. So some of my logic isn't that good, but because I am uh, detecting stains, it helps alert me that if I think I see things on my sensors right now, I can say, oh, yeah, you know what? We are in the middle of a stain. Let's not get carried away. What we think we see in acute angle, that's the, the classic. You know, when I run into these, it looks like a bloody acute angle. My acute angle gets tripped and the thing, you know, I, I do a canned turn on my acute angle. So, you know, there it is. It's all over for me, uh, you know, if I falsely detect it. And with that, I, I do try to figure out, uh, because I had that problem, I added logic to say, you know, in the middle of the acute angle turn, I'm actually checking for things to look reasonable. If they don't, ah, it was a false detect. And I quickly, you know, abort the acute angle. So yeah, just stuff like that seems to have helped uh, get the thing you know, working. But anyway, I'm still falling short on on, abil on the ability to uh, drive the course at the, you know, at the kind of speeds I'd like to. Uh, you know, there are probably limits and you can just sort of do the math. If you're doing 100 updates a second, which I recommend, you get the finest resolution. But if you're going 36 inches a second, every update, that's 0.36 inches, you know. So in other words, every update, at full bore is quite a little jump and you have to be careful you know that your sensors are oriented correctly that you're going to get the data you need you know a, obviously a horizontal line sensor uh, for for brief things when you're hauling buggy down the course is a bad idea you know so you have to have you know different sensor geometries out there if you're going to try to drive fast you know if you're going to go slow no problem you could use a single line sensor and detect a right angle, you know, the classic card uh, pain uh, thing here, you know, we're, we're headed this way. Of course, here's a fat line. That's pretty easy. Let's see where, oh, here we go. Let's drive up to this one. So, you know, obviously, if you're aligned well, you could have a dumb sensor, you know, a single horizontal line sensor uh, detect this, this state. Of course, here it's, I'm rejecting it. it's too fat of, a, of an intersection. So I guess my hey, thing hey, Ron. is... Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking when we were listening to Chris talking about uh, B6, where you kind of have that little zigzag with the little um, dashes, it occurred to me that if you're running as fast as you and he are running, there's just about no way you could have a sensor pick that up fast enough and react to it fast enough. Is that right? Concerning? Right. Yeah. So ultimately, well, my solution and probably Chris's too is you just got to put the brakes on for some of those features. But, you know, I, or, or you run them open loop. Uh, let's see if I can. Oh. 
you know, like if we go here, I'll just say go. Wait, what? What are we doing? Because that you were saying, it's like every sense is every, every sensor intake is from that three three inches later. That's like halfway across there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm ha oh, one thing, just I'll point out. I that feature I added that does the uh, so we're in the middle of a run, and if I drop a marker, it does that state marker. And I've really not been using that feature. And that can be a pain. If you end up with state markers and they just frustrate you, uh, remember that they're creating a file out there that has an SRS extension and you can delete that file mm -hmm. or files. You'll find them in the data folder. I should make a note of this and the, uh, the main folder. But sometimes those get on my nerves because I'm not using that feature right now. So let me try to erase it and then try to stop the robot. Let's see if this will work. I'm just going to show you this other I'll, I'll drive a little of this so you can see i'm not perfect uh let's see if i drop a marker there let's see if we can go oops so you know i don't quite get the line there and i have to go slow here in order to track that well so anyway but mm. uh but chris is going a lot faster i can tell by his patterns you know i can tell the ways around in some of these corners I'm, I'm taking them a little square, but that's because I'm going slower. And I need to learn how to go faster, I guess, if I'm going to compete. You know, so, we, so just now, when you made it through the gap in E2, you, you didn't do a canned maneuver, right? You just, you just kind of... Yeah, I probably uh, got scared and slowed down. You could probably tell how fast I was going. Let's see if we... Uh, I'll move back here a little bit further. And let's go and then let's see and i'll slow it down a bit so you can see my velocity look oh i'm going really slow look six okay. second so i panicked probably when i saw this and let I let me see this how are you doing this okay so which sensor are you using there <laughs> okay so oh yeah that inner circle uh, that inner half circle what, okay what that's, that? that's key here that's key here i think <laughs> Oh, something happened to the sensors. Oh, they went away. Now, this is Carl's request. This check box here. You clicked the, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Oh, and then, and then you could get rid of the user panel, too. Okay. Well, so you have all these super fancy arrays of sensors. I'm I'm taking a different approach because it, so it's, it was so complicated the last time with computer vision and everything in the real world. I thought I'd go backwards and do the simulator with a relatively simple approach. So, yeah. I actually have, um, I'm actually using a model of something, you, a line sense, one or more line sensors you could buy from Pololu. Okay. okay. So that's my intent here is to, is to, not that I would because it's more soldering than I want to do, but it, it, it has a chance of being physically realizable. Right. Yeah. And that's probably where I'm at is I now need to see, of course, I use a video camera, but who knows? I. I've probably cheated a little bit in the positioning of my sensors, and I'll I'll have some problems with my real robot, you know, that doesn't isn't able to see all the way back to its wheels. Can't see through the wheels. What's no, wrong? can't see through them. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid it. Uh, it we'll see how it goes. They're Wonder Woman invisible wheels. Yeah. <laughs> And anyway, so that's, that's that. Any any questions or anything I can say? I have a anybody? question about uh, uh, the the rule for this following line. I observe um, you at say that at the right corner, you are detecting the line that's already turned. Um, do you have to go through that right corner, or you just say, okay, it's you know the line is turning that way. I'll just I'll just, I mean, I'm steering yeah, well, that's, that. Yeah, that's but, yeah, the, that's, uh, that's the, I guess Doug is the one who's probably biting his well, lip on that yeah. one. That's why we have judges, right? Because we, we don't have this RMS squared deviation measure. We don't have something technical like that that bounds how far you can be away. It's just like, if the, I think it's, what it's been in the past, I think it is just, it's just judges and peer pressure. Would you agree with that, Doug? Well, I think we. I think that if you read the rule set, I tried to make it very clear. But we remember the breadcrumb is the center of the robot. All right. There's no requirement that the center of the robot be on the line all the time. So I mean, if you're off a little bit here and there, uh, especially I would imagine at higher speed, that's 
that's the way if you watch a real robot, you know, that's the way they work. Um, but you do got to follow the line. If you look at, there's a whole section in the rules on that. So it calls out a couple of examples if you're not following the line. So it's more of a continuous detection of, of the line or knowing where you're going, right? It doesn't yeah. have to be on the line, but you need to have the right target. Right. That, so, but right. I think like uh, Ron is doing the right thing. And those S curves, there's probably a maximum speed that you can take them at. And I mean, you know, if you're only, you know, Let's see, if you're going, what was it, 36, 3.6 inches? Per, if you're doing 100 samples a second, all right, and you're going 36 inches per second, you're going to go 3.6 per reading. No, 0. 0.36. 0. 0.36? Yeah, because 36 divided by 100 is okay, 0. Okay, 0. All right, okay, 0. 0.36. Yeah, that's, that's forward speed, though. You could be yeah. rotating. Yeah, but, but if you're also <coughs> in your that those line segments, there's how many line segments? Can, you got your course up, Ron. How many line segments are oh, in that S curve? Tell you what, here, I'll put the thing back up and I'll show, show you <laughs> where the sensor location is, which is sort of interesting uh, for those that didn't see it. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, I'll fire up the thing. Wait a minute. Get out of here. Hey, guys. Um, the, uh, the winds out here were very strong. It actually picked up a glass top table, a piece of patio furniture, and Root against the wall and broke it, so you might. Wow. Well, well, I just had to go outside because I heard something. I wasn't sure whether it was the air raid sirens or my neighbors having sex next door. Who's the sirens here? Wow! I'm gonna meet the air raid sirens. It was indeed air raid sirens. Oh, it's an area. <laughs> Apparently, there's there is a tornado in Arlington, so I, I you know, I was just quite a ways away. For most of us, and yeah, there was one in Selena too. Oh, and okay. sirens apparently going off in oh. Dallas. Oh, get the thunder to make it go away or something. So they're going a bit nuts at the moment. Air raid oh, sirens. Wow. <laughs> your uh, it looks like uh, your experience may vary, but I checked the weather if I were you. <laughs> We've never had those that high out here. There's one of those hook kind of uh, things in the front heading towards University Park right now. Yep. Ooh. Just past Irving. Irving. Well, let me go pull that back up. I thought that was going to be. Uh... Yeah, if you guys are to the south, I know some of us are to the north, and it's already past me here at Louisville, but uh, I'm over. For, for those of you that are like along 75 and to the east, you might want to, especially to the south, you might want to check. I mean, yeah. East of that, I'm over by almost Mesquite, out 30 ways where I am. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, it oh. should be by you then, I think. No, it's coming up to uh, like Dallas. So that's like Cro Crocker Hill, Love Field area, Richardson. Yeah, that's where it is at right now. Yeah, let me see the radar. Yeah, I don't think it's made it to Mesquite yet. No, nope. uh, it's yeah, been we're... close. It's basically downtown Dallas right now. Yeah, and there was a uh, tornado warning for Dallas issued. Yeah, yeah, it, it looks like Kareem it's, it's downtown. I am about uh, according to this thing. I think mean, our com is pretty good. Oh, oops. yeah. Oh. I'll get off this just for fun, um, and I'm, I'll stop presenting after this. Just, okay. just for fun, and this was Will's suggestion, is the red crumbs, and I'd be happy if anybody emails me whatever, I could send you the, uh, it's a, a tab. I didn't add it to the library, but it's, I basically harvested the crumb code and added uh, a few computations to come up with uh, the front of the robot. So the front of the robot is kind of where around the point of where I'm really sensing the line. And it's just interesting to note that if that part of the robot, which is really, as Will points out, that's the part of the robot following the line, the, the, the wheels are just tracking. Uh, but just, just for, for your information here, you can see, look at how wild this is. Well, that's where the, basically the nose of the robot, close to where I'm typically sensing the line. I do use some of the different uh, 
arcs, uh, depending on what features are present. But uh, anyway, it just kind of shows you how wild uh, the front of the robot is with respect to the line. And yet that's the thing that's trying to track the line. So, you, and in fact, you can start to see uh, why I'm probably so close to failing really on some of these, you know, wild uh, turns here is because really the part that's tracking the line is just about to lose the thing. But anyway, that's just, just for fun. And again, that's just a sort of a parallel set of crumbs that just by adding some code, you know, you can have access to. But personally, I've the last few days when I've really been into this, I really haven't cared about that feature. It was fun to see, but I'm, I'm more interested in, in knowing if I screw up recognition of patterns and stuff. But that's my, my story and that's, that's it. And I'll quit presenting. Yeah, the point I was trying to make is though that there are eight line segments in the S curve. They're one and a half inches long and they're offset, I think, um, I wanna say each segment is set, I think three quarters of an inch over. You can look at the, the thing. So, you know, you can kind of take a look at what your, the window your sensor is gonna be able to look at it before it's gone. You know what I mean? If, like I say, if you get, if you're going full speed uh, and you're going 0.36 inches, and that means that you, you could, in an ideal world, you could probably have any line segment hit five times in your, in your code. Well, yeah. Uh, or four lots times. And, yeah, and, and, the big, and really it's only seven segments and the eighth segment is split from the front and the back. So that's only 0.75 inches. So, so that's not too bad if the next line is a straight line, but if the next line is a curve, that really is going to be, anyway. Okay. Oh, kitty. Okay. I'm just saying. Is that a body following robot? It's the mouse following robot. Actually, he won't get near mice. He's a, he's a complete failure as a cat. <laughs> Mr. Doug, how about how about at your end? I know we've been you and I have been awfully busy with uh, you know John and others. Nothing. Hmm? You know what I've been doing? I've been working on the website, getting it ready, getting yeah. the rule sets ready. So, you know, we're I think we're done. We're ready. So, if you have any questions, you can about the rules. You should be able to go straight to the rule set and look at it. Uh, and obviously every Tuesday we talk about it if anybody has a question. But you can always drop me an email if you have a, a real concern and we'll get it into, there is a page though it doesn't have anything on the virtual where we put down common questions that people ask. There's nothing there for this contest. But if you guys have questions, we can generate answers to that to go on that part that part of the page but uh so anyway uh Carl, i'm gonna put a banner on the front that's probably the last thing i'm gonna do on that okay and then we'll and then put it out to the list okay uh, cool. yeah I, I updated the meetup and published it yeah, so. i saw that so I, that's why i don't feel as big a stress on it i figured most people are following both yeah i think the people that know know already so yeah Okay. Cool. Well, that's my story as well. We were so busy trying to start all those things out that uh, about all I managed to do was to um, rework my invisible detectors, which I'll, sh I'll reveal after I fail at the contest. But <laughs> I have a new line detector. I, it's remarkable to me how how uh, how useful uh, and 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 uh, basically versatile that. Uh, uh basic uh, simple bot detector is because it it really is kind of robust in a lot of ways yeah but but uh and that's still what's driving this right now but anyhow um you know it, it's not very good at the end because all it does is uh i gotta put my new sensors into use follow something yeah cool and look at it. <laughs> It made it to the end. It's awesome. done. Lots of those. <laughs> it made it. 
It made it right to the finish line. <clears throat> Even faster. It learned. It got faster this time. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's not quite the way it's supposed to go. But I'm going to just wash my hands. That's three times in a row yep. in about a minute and 20. So top that, guys. It's reliable. Predictable. Okay. Repeatable. That's good. <laughs> it's oh. certainly, certainly faster than Chris anyway. Well, well <laughs> talk it here. I did, and I didn't really characterize what the problem was, but when I was trying to do my rotated line sensors, I think there's probably some bugs hanging around in some of the uh, line sensor, not the not the reading of the sensors, but the if you specify a sensor, you may find some frustration in you know the array length versus where you place it and all that. So there's probably something creeping around there, but uh, since I'm not allowed to update the library anymore, uh, I'm not Maybe. going there. So fix is 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's, that's part sure. of the fun, right? Yeah. The so fun. there's probably a few quirks, but to at least to say well, it's an undocumented right. feature, right? What's exactly. that? It's an undocumented right. feature, right? Uh, but the good thing is I've been, you know, at least with my controller and the work I've been doing, I haven't had, uh, I can't tell you really, it, it's possible if I let the thing run a long time. I've, I've, you know, on rare, rare occasions, I've had to shut down the program, but uh, I really feel like it's pretty stable. I mean, most of the logic is not that complicated in this program, but, uh, but anyway, um, so at least I can vouch that I can run this contest. I won't say how fast I can run it because I want to go faster, but uh, it, stuff seems to be working. You know what I mean? <laughs> or, That's good. or it's the typical way I deal with things. I don't read the documentation. I really don't know how to use the program. And there's probably millions of bugs. It's like Blender or something. It's so complicated. Uh, you know, it could be full of bugs and I'd never know. The only time I know is if something just freezes up. You know, I try to do a Boolean operation on something and it hangs. Okay, that's obvious. It's a bug. But otherwise, I probably just work right around them. Maybe everybody else is the same. I don't know. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Okay. Well, let's like that. That's it. Cool. Thanks. All right. It looks like Kareem went to uh, hunker down. He said a tornado's heading his way. Um, oh, he, he moved, not, too. But... He, so he's out kind of at the edge of civilization. And... Well, further south, anyhow. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I, I think Ray is in the edge of civilization, Ray and, and uh, Steve. But uh, we won't say anything about Murray, but... Okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, looks like downtown the the warnings are gone, expired. So oh, okay. it looks like yeah. we're we're past this. Move through. Yeah, you know where where Murray lives, where we live. You know our fear is you know flying cows, but where you live, it's probably flying sheep. I think they're softer. You know, you get hit by a flying sheep, you probably got a chance. But here in Texas, it's cows. And that's yeah. what happens, you know, when the wind starts to circulate, you look up and you see cows. Yeah. Or like that one time in Dallas. Um, uh oh, you're muted. <laughs> it was I was going to say, at a fraction point like that, like that, there's actually sheep up on that hill. And within line of view, I can actually see them from here, from my study <laughs> window. So if... The winds blow and they, you know, the wind, Wellington is one of the windiest, I think it is the windiest city in the world. Those sheep could get lofted and they'd come right through this window. I'd be dead. Wow. Killer yeah. sheep. Killer <laughs> sheep. <laughs> actually, actually, there's a New Zealand film, if you can rent it. It's, it's one of those really stupid black humor films. And it's called, I think, Black Sheep. And it's a, a stupid horror film where the sheep get genetically modified and ki start killing people. Made in New Zealand. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's really bad. And that's, that's your numbers, cool. you probably have a lot more sheep than people. So, you know. Yeah, what is it? Uh, like two to three to one, four to one. Is it seven well, million sheep? Two million actually, people? what's what's happened in a lot? Since I've been here about 14 years, I think now. And in the time I've been here, the vast number of sheep are now down to about half of what they are and they've been replaced oh. by cows we've got lots of cows now oh you do okay yeah 
But cows cool. aren't as efficient as sheep, right? I would think that's not a good swap. Well, it's the market value. If you, my family's farmers, you do what makes money, and sheep uh, farming isn't making as much money as cattle farming. And everything here is grass fed, so all the cows here are grass fed. So mm, uh, that's nice. Yeah, we don't do any feed lots here. Mm. 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 So there's a I found the link to your your movie. Uh, Murray has uh, Rotten Tomatoes of seventy two percent, so it's on the list now. That's awesome. Oh, cool! It's really yeah. stupid funny. I have to say. <laughs> okay, that's cool. So, Mr. Zahn, what, what have you got going on? Uh, quite a lot. I can yeah. I can show you guys something. Uh, let me try <clears throat> share one of my screens. See, hopefully. Let me know if you guys can see my screen. It's on. It's a, uh, it's it's a window like two windows. It's full. You, yeah, you we see it? It. Okay, yeah. So um, my recent uh, work past week is, I got that feedback. I mean, I got the feedback working last week, but uh, I was able to display. Let me show you guys. Um. So all right. Hopefully my camera is still working. It's the same good old robot with the, uh, I'm just controlling two motors here. Uh, two motors here, right? And uh, the good thing is I have a UI. So if I run this, so this is, this is the trace of my feedback signal. I have a reference, but let me run this. So I'm basically switching the set point around. I'll, I'll put this down. Um, it's going back and forth, I guess. So or between two speeds, maybe. I mean, it goes so in on the target speed pretty quickly. Yeah, I can uh, yeah. try um, modify these values slightly just to see if I have uh, if I drop the p gain. I mean, if I put p gain zero, <clears throat> it'll have more overshoot. If I put i gain smaller, it will have less overshoot, but it will be, be it'll be slower. Right. Take longer time. So it's kind of natural that uh, I mean it's following the rule that I'm expecting a bit a bit uh, higher gain. I can tune this kind of uh, good good response, right? So anyway, uh, this is this is one thing I want to show for the speed. Then I tried the the position. So like motor position. Initially, I got into so so. Let me show you guys what I have. <clears throat> Basically, it won't converge on the position because um, what you see here is. Do you guys see my plot? It's a curve here. Oh, sorry. Let me. Okay, so this is this is X is my drive y is my speed right so uh maybe you can see this so basically i mean i guess you guys all know when i drive very small it doesn't do anything but at certain point yeah. it'll start moving uh i mean it'll say if, now it's 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 fixed it's stopped right so i would keep driving 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 at certain point it'll start moving when I come back, it'll it will move, and then there's a dead zone again, and the negative side is symmetric. It's same, right? It's so so anyway. So there's this uh, nonlinearity there. Uh, there's a dead zone, and there's this hysteresis. 
I don't know how, how you guys deal with this, but basically when I put a position feedback, it will it'll go close and it'll it'll just it's like a periodic periodic um what do you call this nonlinear uh, periodic cycle, right? No, periodic orbit. So anyway, it's like it won't stay because that's the stable condition where it's just jumping from one state to another. Um, I I walked around and I can show you guys. Uh, basically, what I did is I I can linearize this. I can map the drive by eliminating the center dead zone, and then to remove this um, uh, the the hysteresis. What I did is when it's stay when it's changing direction or it's from stop to go, I can kick it with a high drive. And then I look at the encoder, let's say five counts, after five counts, I'll say, okay, it is moving. I switch to my expected drive. But I don't know, I mean, is this the right way? Uh, I mean, uh, talk, talk to me about this. This is my first question. I'll show you guys what is my position feedback. But yeah, give me a, give me a second. My comment would be is that the first place to attack it is to try to reduce mechanically reduce your hysteresis and your dead band uh, because clearly that much is quite abnormal. Uh, oh, so, the, the 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 amount of dead zone or the hysteresis. Yes. So what I yeah. think is is that uh, in software you can't fix things where mechanically it's <laughs> uh -huh. but uh, you don't expect a dead zone in or under hysteresis i i was really expecting yeah. this. no it's it's to be expected but the amount that you're showing looks really bizarre um i am only showing the center so so for my, i mean this is even the better case this is, I, I've got two motors. One is this cheap motor from Amazon, kind of a low power one. And this one, uh, the power I can drive, I need to go up to say 30 something. I mean, 30, uh, 30 is total 255 full power, right? So if I go to 30 and it's a 12 volt motor, it'll start moving, but, um, See, sometimes it doesn't switch until 40. I, I mean, when I'm driving it, I say the, the start of the secure yeah, voltage right. to drive it. Just On the start motor, it's the voltage. Uh, go ahead. It's because you're varying the voltage. You're not going to, it's not going to be a linear thing. It's just not because it's going to take so much voltage just to get to going. And then there yeah. may be some linear, maybe some linearity, but after a certain amount of voltage, it's not going to be linear anymore. It's going to taper off. It's how those motors work. Yeah, so I mean, this linearity is is a problem. <laughs> I mean, when I was doing this, oh, okay, let me show you guys my um, my my position feedback. Now I, I updated my code, and uh, I I'm actually now having position. So now my reference would be. Uh, start this. Well, wait, wait. Oh, my gain is too high. All right. All right. Sorry. My gain is too high. Okay. All right. Um, let me think. What am I doing here? I had a uh, I'll, I'll download this code again. So let me, let me, I think I have an integrator there. So let me do this again. Oops. Just to reset it. But yeah, I have to be careful with the gain. Um, I mean, the, the approach, I'll show you guys, it is, it is working, but I don't like this, um, I have to know what is the starting voltage and, and this kind of motor specific information. So 
Shouldn't have to. Shouldn't have to worry about the start uh, that for you're talking about just running like a PID. No, no, yeah, because not. I need to compensate the nonlinear nonlinearity there. Uh, well, you can. For one thing, John, you can. You uh, are you actually driving a motor? Is this data from a real motor that you're trying to spin? Um, it is a it is a real motor. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the reason why I'm saying because one of the things that might be impacting you is the um, is your uh, uh, PWM frequency that you're using. Okay. Uh, you you um, it has to do with the inductance of the motor's coils. And picking, you know, if you just use, are, are you using Arduino or what, what are you using? It's it, Arduino. Okay, so Arduino, they have uh, a default, a default PWM frequency that, I mean, that's just what they use. Uh, but the actual microchip, uh, microcontroller is quite capable of all of different PWM frequencies. And uh, I mean, my, if I recall, I think you want a higher one, a higher frequency, if I remember right. Uh, so, so it's more like a, like a, a filter after filter. It's a it's a continuous. Um, well, you 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 with the PWM interacts with the with the impedance of the of the motor. So you want to find one. That will give you the best, the best. Otherwise, the minimum offset and the most linear function. Like Harold said, you know, if you got the wrong one, it's not uh -huh. going to be. Very, it's not going to be. Very I, linear. See. I see. I see. So it's gonna, you guys really think this is that? You know, the one I measured this for my um, the high power motor from Pololo. Yeah. It it is even worse. It's like it yeah. goes way like 100 something before it starts moving. Yeah, this sounds like a PWM problem. Uh, are, you, okay. are you talking no load too? No load, or, yeah, no, yeah, no yeah, load. Yeah, 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 you got something wrong. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the PWM uh, on the Mega is 490 hertz on some of the pins and eight, or sorry, 980 on other pins, it really just depends like um, 2 through 13, 44 and through 46 is 490 yeah. hertz. And 5 and 6 is actually 8, sorry, pins 5 and 6 is actually 980 hertz. So yeah, mm -hmm. it depends even which ones you call out. I, they, don't, they don't tell you that. But they yeah. are, are different. So you, it depends. that would be a good way for you to see if you get a, a change. Is I the, see. I'll, I'll see what I can do with the yeah. specifying the PWM frequency here. Or, or the so, voltage. I mean, are, are you giving the proper voltage to the motors? Yeah, I'm using uh, this, this block battery, 12 volt battery. I didn't measure it, but uh, I can I can I can measure it. Yeah. Yeah. So you I think might you, want, um, you might want to, if it. When you say a block battery, um, you just all you have to do is put your your uh, voltmeter across the battery leads. If it sags, yeah, like then this type it, of battery. Oh, that should be plenty. For you right. just doing little polo loop motors, right? You know, like twenty five millimeter motors. Is that what size motors did you get? Um, you did twenty five, um, twenty, twenty five, and thirty seven. All of them should. The 37, you might have a little issues with on that one. Depending mm -hmm. on whether they have like, they also have a low, medium, and high current version of the motor. It's the medium power. I think it's the medium power. Yeah. Yeah. You have to watch I, I mean, I can go. So, so basically, you guys say I don't have, I don't really have to deal with this, this nonlinearity in the drive. Right? Not the PID makes, it makes it all go away. I and, mean, and, uh, um, so the reason I want to use this position feedback is I imagine the, the way I want to use the motor is I want to tell the robot to go to a certain place. Oh, yeah. For example, 
like a, like a wafer inspection, right? I mean, I'm not going to do wafer inspection, but that's what I have kind of have in mind where I want to go somewhere, stop, take a picture, and then go to the next place. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking the way I drive it is maybe I should give it a motion profile. Like the feedback keeps going, but I have the feedback loop following a time varying set point. And maybe yeah. I can put that set point as speed. Uh, uh, but I'll, also, I can put it as a position. Usually, <laughs> that's like when they say that, say that uh, they're usually talking about ramp up and ramp down speeds. Uh, you know, so uh, what I'm just saying is that if you shouldn't worry about whether it like initially go, goes to 100 and then drops down. It should, that's what should happen. All right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, because like Harold said, you know, you got to get things inside the motor, got to move, start moving. So it's going to yeah. take a little bit to kick them off. All yeah. right. But, but your controller should handle all of that because you're just telling it what, what your speed you want. I mean, when I was dealing with the speed feedback, I didn't have to do anything. Basically, I say a speed and the PID yeah. takes care of it. Yeah. But it's the position that had had problem. Um, um, John, are you, when you try to get it to go to a position, does it go to that and then oscillate yeah, so, back and forth? Right, right. I mean, it's yeah. kind of natural because um, my drive, when the area is small, my drive will be small. Right. And when it stops, and I ha I need to sit, turn around a little bit, it won't turn because that drive won't be able to kick it off. The time it kicks off, it is it'll go overshoot because yeah, it's already. I mean, the integrator already integrated too much error there. So, so yeah. um. Oh, oh, by the way, I think uh, now you see what? with so I, I have this compensation in there that that I'm. I, I linearized it, got rid of the dead zone, and I can kick it off by um, starting with the higher drive. So now it is doing okay. Um, and we can try. And that's I mean, I, I like this uh, interface here. So, so for the position, kind of the P gain is this old I gain, and the D gain is the old P gain. So if I put. Uh, Higher again. Um, do you have any, a dead band around your target position? Because if you a little bit, yeah, that's too fast. You have to have a little. Yeah, you will overshoot, and then yeah. if your loop is that tight or is looking for that, you're yeah, yeah, um, and then I can let me see. I can give right. it some big end. And hopefully no overshoot. Yeah, now it's no overshoot. Yeah, so I remember a, a while back, um, Karine, right? Uh, oh, sorry, um, Marie. Marie, yeah. So you, you were talking about PID, how to tune the PID for everything. This is what I had in mind, where mm -hmm. I can put a step response in there. I can put PI again, or changing the PID again, and observe the behavior. Uh, and PID again, it doesn't have to be so well tuned. I mean, it's kind of a very robust in, in a sense. You, you you don't have too much overshoot, and you don't you don't have too long, like a, like a, you know, this slope is not too slow. That'll do. So, I think so yeah, the one so. thing that both I and I think Chris even mentioned this, or someone did, was that having like a potentiometer available to manually tune the thing like i've i've actually got a potentiometer mounted on my robot and i can actually sit there and dial the thing until i get stability because doing it with a variable means you have to run the thing over and over again but you can sit there and just dial a you know dial a potentiometer mm -hmm. and, get, and, mm -hmm. and end up with but, uh, how do you know when it's overshooting or not um i mean I, i'm thinking plotting a curve like uh you see what is the drive, what is the, the error, um, like a step response. I, I think this is very intuitive. So. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, what I, okay, I know Chris has a pretty advanced way of doing it where 
but I what I do is I have the data of all those values that I'm interested in just uh, wirelessly transferred over to to uh, my computer and I just plot it on that. Okay, uh -huh. Dave's, Dave's uh, uh, contraction, I don't, uh, dynamometer uh, is probably the, the slickest way to do it. But, uh, you know, I've, and also if, You might find, are you, you might find when you're doing your controller first to start off with a speed controller and then a position controller around, around, you know, around the, the outside of that. So uh -huh. I see, I see it like okay. near the end, near the yeah. very, very last so mile, I'll use a position control. Oh, no, 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 no. They're always running together. All right. But think of it as the position is creating a term that's being fed into your reference. All right. Together. So it's like those are state uh, feedback. Well, uh, like, so like if you're just doing a speed thing, you know, you say, I want it to go 10 centimeters or well, one centimeter in it, uh, per second or whatever. Okay. All right. And the motor just going to will take take that one one centimeter per second that's your reference and then what your actual speed is my you know minus your reference is going to be the error now but if you want to put in you can also put on top of that an input into your reference that is a position or I, I, so. I don't really worry about position so much as I do is angle. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm really trying to correct for angle. So there's a, when the angle generates a term that modifies the reference of the two motors so that now they're going to go what they need to do to maintain proper angle. Mm -hmm. All right. Now that's because I don't really necessarily, you know, just knowing <clears throat> how far you went, that's just doing a, you know, you just do a summation on your encoder ticks. And when you get there, you stop. Mm -hmm. All right. but, I see. I see. You know, so, but yeah. what you're really looking at is uh, if you want to go from point A to point B, the real critical thing is that the angles, the heading is right. Because yeah. it's heading is wrong what that your encoders aren't going to give you good information i mean they're going to yeah. tell you your robot traveled some distance uh -huh. but if it's in the wrong direction it's not going to get you where you want it to be yeah i'm thinking um uh i, I will integrate the i say i have four wheels four encoders uh, i have all the timing and position information so i'm thinking to integrate the position basically x y and the rotation based on those uh, uh those position of the four wheels and i'll uh, command it to go but i have a record of like where it actually went so, so yeah that's why what i'm thinking are you uh let me ask you this uh, are you running this tank mode say again please are you running it in tank mode? Where oh, it's four wheels. Well, I don't have a real robot yet, but I, I'm going to have four wheels. Basically, each wheel have this PID. And uh, when I when I say so I have these four wheels, yeah. and I'll, I'll tell these four wheels, each wheel have a motion profile. And I'll get a like actual position back. And I'll update the profile. Um, so wow. you're, gonna, you're gonna have well your left side and your right side are gonna have yeah like left front left, right front yeah left. but I mean you're gonna have a left so you're not if it's doing tank mode which I think it sounds like what you're doing otherwise you know, the right side's running together and the left side's running together right you're not doing something where you have a, an angle uh, steering like in a car you just have no no but, but, uh, really I just have to the both wheel move the same 
I, I thought I had to do some uh, math there <laughs> to figure out. Well, like, that's what I'm saying. You, should, you know, you're going to have, um, when you turn, okay, with four wheels, you're going to have, you're going to skid. Mm-hmm. All right. So there, if you assume that the position of rotation is midway between the two wheels on the right and the left side, right? You draw a line there and you get, which is probably, if you probably have a rectangular shaped robot and not a square shaped robot, but it'll be halfway between the two axles and in the center of the wheelbase. Do you follow me? Yeah, and in fact, um, like I've got a tank style robot with four wheels, but I've only got encoders on the front set of wheels and they're, the, the motors are wired in parallel. So I only have two controllers, each controller running two motors. And mm-hmm. unless your robot, like I had tried a tank robot with treads, but I gave up on that because they didn't work. Well, my robot's too heavy for it. But with four wheels, one thing I found pretty quickly was that there's almost no way to predict which wheels are going to slip. Like when you're doing a turn, it depends on, you know, the weight of the robot, the balance of the robot, where the, where the balance of the weight on the robot is. Mine's roughly in the center, but even then you still have differences in uh, the surface that you're driving on. And like I drive on my wood deck and as the robot rotates, you can see that it slips differently. So I don't think you can predict exactly. I mean, Doug's point is that you have to kind of assume the center between the wheels, but mm-hmm. in practice, I don't think you're actually going to get what you think. The encoders will give you the motion of the, let's say on my robot, the motion of the front pair of wheels. The back wheels are effectively driving, but they're, I don't have any sensing on them. Uh, the, yeah. the other problem you're going to have, like if you think of it, none of the wheels in that are actually right. Right. Because if they, it, the, you're making an assumption that the wheel that is of interest is really the uh, would be placed where it was if it was a differential robot. Mm-hmm. All right. So you actually got offsets on the front and the back. So the, all four wheels, when you turn, are going to slip. Mm-hmm. Um, All right. So, but, so this, is, this is what I had in mind. Okay, I have this geometry, the four wheels, and mm-hmm. I say, okay, the center of the center of the robot is moving on a trajectory, like yeah. some rotation, some some uh, linear speed. I can yeah. calculate the speed for each of the four wheels. Mm-hmm. And I can tell the four wheels to go. So I mean that that was what I was planning. But uh, do you guys think this is well, is... the simplest way to do this, if you want to use four wheels, is like Murray said. You only have, and, and in fact, if you look at at uh, Dave Anderson's website for his outdoor robot, I think it's called JBot. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, if you look at it, his has actually got six wheels. All right, but he's uh-huh. doing exactly what Murray's talking about. He only has two motors, and he's only got two encoders. But he's got them chained together. He's got them chained together, so the motor, the wheels on the side, are all tied together. Right. Exactly. Yeah, with a belt. Yes. He's got chains. Well, maybe two wheel. I mean, two wheel is easier than four wheel. But uh, yeah, I I was planning to have four wheels all have encoders. Yeah, it depends on. Well, there's nothing wrong with having the. Like I say, if you have four wheels and they're not geared together, then to keep them in sync, you're going to need you need you're essentially gearing them together with your own code. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, right. So you have to have them all run the same. You won't get that. I mean, if you're finding out right now, each motor is its own. What do they call them? Its own own little daisy, you know, or whatever. I mean. Especially, this is its own little snowflake. It's yeah, so they're all different, and mm-hmm. uh, so mm-hmm. if, so when you put encoders on each wheel, what are, what you're effectively doing is gearing them together. 
Yeah. If you if you're yeah. tuned up correctly. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, and you know, you I've seen. Uh, uh, God, I wish you, they had all their videos still up. Uh, Shybots, which is out of Chicago, used to do uh, outdoor rovers every year, very similar to the Seattle Tip Club. And, uh, you know, they had robots where the wheels would turn. You know, they, they, would, they would turn, mm -hmm. so there was a turning on them too. To try and come try to get rid of the skid all right you know like in your car if i remember right if you look at if you were looking into somebody who designed the difference between was uh an ackerman drive and one that's not an ackerman drive but looks like an ackerman drive has to do with how they camber the front wheels and whatnot so that path when it turns, you know, one wheel is going to turn longer than the other path, so they have compensation for that. Uh, yeah. But that's a little bit above, above most hobbyists. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, I let me see if I can find. I mean, I had, I ran a, and one when you saw, I'm sure you saw, there was a little four wheel Vex robot that I used to run around in um, six cam. Mm -hmm. It, it was two it was uh two motors and gears between all the two of the other wheels and it went you know no problem at all so mm -hmm. so i mean there's nothing wrong with having four wheels and four encoders but you're going to have to have speed a speed pid loop on each pair so like if you're telling the left side to go 100 and the right side to go 50 so that it's turning you want both wheels to be over 100 and both wheels on the other side to be going 50. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I had considered actually having four PID controllers, four encoders and PID controllers, as you said. But the way I, in my sort of playing around with it, I realized that when the robot was on the wooden deck and it did a turn, like I said, even with a relatively weight balanced robot, it was unpredictable as to which of the front or rear or wheels were actually doing most of the skidding because it was going to skid around a corner that has to. And so even if I had four rather than two pairs, you know, four encoders, I wouldn't know which encoder to trust. And I just figured that I was just going to go best case and just assume that the back wheels were skidding at roughly the same and, and just kind of go with it. Because I, if I had, it, you know, Four encoders rather than two makes it a lot more complicated, and you can't trust which of the pairs front or rear of the encoders you even know as being the more accurate. So maybe you could average them. Like yeah, that. You, I just, you just have to average. Them. You average them, or, yeah. Uh, yeah. You guys uh, remember? Um, math is if you look the, at the math, math's not any different per se mm -hmm. between a differential and the four wheel skid. That yeah. the can the can and except that where you have to calculate the, the, the true center of rotation. Uh, the it's 10 o'clock p.m. Sorry, it's my alarm. Okay. But uh, let's see. Like I say, think of it as if you only had two wheels and they were geared together. I mean they were geared together. What would how would you treat that? Okay. To follow the same speed. Or, the, or that, that would make the same speed. So yeah. if, if you think of them as being geared together, I think yeah. mentally you'll you'll be okay in figuring out your code. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember uh, one. I, I forgot the name, but one of the senior members here, he was saying using the the integrated wheel position, he can get better orientation. Then um, say that uh, that uh, yeah. uh, compass a sensor, right? I mean, I, I hope I can by driving it at the same fi fashion that it's it's not fighting each other and there's no skid. <laughs> I mean, well, when I'm not driving too fast either. But I was yeah. hoping that skidding is is not normal. But, okay. Well, then again, you got to figure out what do you really want to do. You know, I mean. 
realize that people have built robots similar to yours and come within, you know, sub half inch of uh, after doing a, a 10 foot per side square without, I mean, that's happened in our club many times. So, I mean, you can, you can do that without, that, you know, if you're trying to get it like within a couple of microns, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. okay, all right. But yeah. if you're trying to, I mean, it's like Dave, you know, if you, if you showed Dave your robot and it went to the other side of the room and came back and it came back to a place that was six or seven inches within where it started, he would say you were doing great. Okay. I now, in, in actuality, you know, you know, most of us wouldn't be really happy with that in a, in an indoor environment, and we would try to make it better. And we, and you can, all right. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you made it go out there and back 15, 20 times, you know, it's the cumulative error is going to be pretty bad. It'll slowly drift off because you yeah. need, in that case, you need some sort of mapping or something that you can, yeah. you can correct. Yeah. I, I think that's my plan too, but I want to make it uh, mm, as as good as possible. Like it will yeah. integrate its own position and figure out the roughly mm -hmm. the, the right location. Well, first so, yeah. first first task is to go in a straight line. Yeah. <laughs> second, <laughs> exactly. second, uh, second task is to go in a straight line, turn, and come back because. The turning, it will tell you pretty quickly how good you're heading, you're getting your heading right. Because uh -huh. you see, when you turn, uh, if you do it completely under PID control, it's going to do something like this. A real soft, and then it'll come back and then down. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to just pivot in a position. You, when you pivot in position, you have to put some sort of, you, 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 well, I don't know, I won't say you have to. Mm. The way I do it is, you know, if the error is b bigger than a certain value, then it turns until that error comes back. Yeah. Okay. Because you're looking at heading. You're not looking at yeah. speed. You're looking at heading. So it's, yeah. you, you could call it a ballistic turn, but the wheels are turning at a controlled rate. And then when it comes back, the heading, you know, so you start off, it's 180 out, and it says, whoops, you got a problem. So we're going to go into this special mode of turning. Because if you don't, then it will correct it by trying to turn around. And, it, you know, it'll be real gentle, or it'll be, it can be real gentle, or it can be a little bit gentle. But it's not just going to sit there and, there and go, Gee! that's not going to happen. That yeah, yeah. you're gonna have to do something. You're gonna have to tell it stop. I don't want to go forward. Forward is out. I've got to be turning. And then, but I'm now 180. Now I'm 90. Now I'm 45. Now I'm 10. Now I'm three. Now I'm one. I, I'm one. I go back to my normal mode, and it comes back down. Mm -hmm. Thank you for naming. Yeah, let me see how how I can have a smooth motion profile. But, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I I'm uh, yeah I'm working toward that. Uh, okay. Another another question. Uh, anybody have experience using this uh, called state space feedback? It's I'm it's sorry? like um, a state space feedback. I mean, I I'm was I'm not I learned it from graduate school, but I, I don't think I ever got it. <laughs> I'm not I'm not quite catching the word. State what, what? state space. It's like space? for example. Like outer space, state, right? Like, space, yes, yeah, state, space. Oh, state. Yes. Yeah, state, space. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I, I, I was. Uh, I think it's it's the right way that I should learn. But uh, I, if anybody has it, <laughs> I could at least yeah. have some backup here. I thought Will Kunkel did a presentation on that. What last year? Didn't he? He, he has a working robot with state space. I thought control. he did. Doug, didn't Will Kunkel do some things with that? Yeah, I think Will has been using the state space approach. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Cool. Yeah, Will is really, really sharp in mathematics. You know. Yeah, yeah. it's. I mean, it's so, definitely doable because um, at graduate school we do homework, and I, you know, tell me <laughs> how I did that homework because <laughs> I don't really understand. It. <laughs> but anyway, it's a it's a good thing. Um, but yeah. you might, you know, I'm sure you wouldn't mind you if you wanted to email them. Uh, you know, you can go out on the member list and just uh, uh, email them a mail, and you know, keep it simple, and mm -hmm. not, and he probably would respond. Mm -hmm. give you some yeah. Idea. yeah. Okay. The argument between the mathematician and the engineer, you know, there, there's, uh, if you took the space between, you know, like any any distance, um, and you halved it, you know, um, and there was a very attractive young woman at the other end of this distance, you know, the mathematician would say you would never get there, but the engineer would say if you keep having it. You're going to be close enough for all practical purposes. So you, you mean the PID is more practical? <laughs> well, no, it's well, just uh, no. Kind but, of the approach is to stuff, you know, so, turning bocce ball. It's close enough. Sometimes perfection isn't really uh, isn't really what's required, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was so I was trying to do this. Um, uh, say the like a. Uh, inverted pendulum, for example, right? So it's like several parameters to control several parameters together. Like you want to move somewhere and you want to keep some something balanced. So that's, I think that that has to be, uh, I, don't, I honestly don't, don't know how to do it with PID because we have only one, one control. But um, yeah. They do PID all the time. Uh, you know, on that one, just go to Instructables and, and look balancing robots up. And uh, you'll probably find a hundred, hundred different ways to do it. Yeah, that problem has been solved. Yeah. Like PID. Yeah. Well, not uh, probably not all, you know, Instructables is a, is like the internet. There's good, good ones and there's That's ones that aren't so good. So you have to kind of, you'll have to shift through them. And I mean, you know, like if you look at it and the, and the robot looks like it's very well made and the guy's talks, what he says seems to make sense, then you probably got a good one. You know, if it looks like it's made out of cardboard with, you know, masking tape and holding the wheels up and the guy's talking about his first Arduino project, it's probably one you want to skip. So, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. but and I, I'm sure you could find it on Hackaday. Hackaday tends to be better, uh, but you know, I just have to search around. Yeah. I, I like Instructables a lot. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I mean, I, yeah. I've seen some Instructables that were just, you know, uh, really eye-opening. Great. I mean, great, great stuff. But it's not not every Instructable. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, well, so yeah, that's kind of uh, my, my demo. It takes a long time, but yeah. Thanks, guys. So, but again, this is this is my PID tuning. If anybody is interested in. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, I like the approach. Though. I mean, I, I mean, you're getting the data. It's nice. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I like my system now. So it's kind of this uh, Arduino. I, I have a feeling I'm. I, I'm. Uh, I know what's happening in the guys, you know, so I uh, feel so confident. Yeah. <laughs> like well, moving next, forward with the, with the, mm -hmm. you know, good controller. The next step, Jane, will be to, to to build something like uh, what Dave did, because now you, what you're going to find is whatever you tuned up while it was sitting there spinning in the air, isn't going to work <laughs> when you put it on the ground. It's just that. It's, it's really different. And every time you put more weight or take weight off or change weight around, you know, you probably have to adjust with it a little bit. That's with it. So, yeah. you know. More fun. <laughs> oh, the real fun. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah, thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks for sharing. That's great. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. impressive.
Cool. So how right. are you determining heading? I mean, I'm guessing at my heading. Um, isn't it? Uh, so my understanding is if you have the left wheel and right wheel, the yeah. difference in yeah. the distance is <laughs> is the rotation. It's like it's like you have a bar and you move it one side one inch, the other side half inch. Then, well, it's a rigid body. So I, I mean, that's how I, I was planning to integrate based on my three, four wheel position. Okay. So you're computing what you think the heading should be if nothing's left. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, based on the the encoder measured distance. Okay. I am yeah. gonna. Um, and, yeah, go ahead. Oh, and if and if you're calculating in radians, of course, if you end up having, let's say, in the long journey on your robot, having gone around maybe three or four times, you're still going to have a heading. I'm not you sure that what you think the heading is. Man, let's say your robot's driven all over the place like this. Even after all of that, you can still calculate the difference between the left and right um, mm -hmm. encoder counts. Even if it's gone around a few times in a circle, it'll still give you the heading, the current heading. Mm -hmm. What it thinks the heading is if nothing's left. Well, yes, yes, of course. Okay. Well, it's not like you're using uh, a, a compass or anything. That's what I was getting at. Well, what I, I, I am actually trying to... I. Previously was using a BNO 055 or 055, and I've just switched over to this BNO 088, which is uh, it actually is a, a nine degree of freedom sensor that has a compass on it that is quite complicated behind the scenes. It's a little black box, and it gives you an actual heading, compass heading. Yeah, but but without any of that, you yeah. you know just using the kinematics. Of a differential robot, you can figure out a heading if you know what your encoder counts are. Okay. Uh, I haven't well, got to that point yet, but I've thought about it. Yeah, well, it's real. It's, it's, look at Dave Anderson's website. He's got an example, some example code, which is really good. And I want to uh -huh. say, I just can't remember exactly everything. It's something like uh, I know the wheelbase is involved. Uh, He's got a calculation that involves theta. Yeah, yeah, it, but it's if you look it up, it, it's not very hard, and you you can just use the two encoders. So like if you have motors with encoders on them, then you can you can get a heading reading. Now, I think. The problem you have with doing it that way is that it it will eventually drift away because you can't take care of things like wheel. You hit a bump, one wheel gets a couple of extra encoder cut. So you know, but uh, realistically, just very simple. When I first started out and everything, you can get that to work uh, for you know. Any contest that we do, that you don't need any more than that to do most of our contests. Now, something like uh, doing that approach, like I said, I've done quarter inch on a you know, big square, come back to this exact same plot, quarter of an inch. But, you know, I don't do it that way anymore because, like Murray, I'm using a, you know, a, I M U because it's easy. And instead of calculating, I just use the I M U heading from the I just use it from the uh, the gyro. the yeah the what do they call it? Gyro. Gyro, yeah. Just use the gyro heading. But I mean, Doug, I think you should differentiate what is called a relative heading versus the absolute heading. And the absolute heading is a compass point, zero to three sixty, whereas relative heading what that's they, a little, yeah. Yeah, and what Dave Anderson was doing is he was basically assuming that every any building in, in interiors, he was basically running into a corner, locating a corner, assuming that in a normal house or a building, the walls are usually north, south, east, west. He would go into a corner and kind of back and forth in the corner to figure out, you know, he does this little maneuver on his videos. You can see it. It kind of goes back and forth in a corner and figures out where the flats of the walls are. And then he can kind of set that effectively an absolute heading 
when he figures out where the corner is. Oh yeah, and, and uh, that's, that's how yeah. you that's how you can correct. And like in six in the six can, you can use the walls. Mm -hmm. In fact, most people use the walls, but you don't need to use the wall. If you get hit by a robot in the arena, then you're you're going to be screwed. Mm. But if you're running by yourself, you don't need you know. If you've just got a reasonable a reasonable way to calculate heading, you're fine for the length of that contest. Yeah. Uh, you just revealed your Achilles heel there. All, all you have to do is come out and bump your robot. Well, no, no. The real answer is 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 like I say, if you have an IMU, then <laughs> then then when you get hit, you you know you get a you get an yeah. acceleration impact. And then yep. you take that that value, and then you go into you find the walls and figure out how to screw up on them. One good bump, and Doug's running into walls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so your experience has been is that the IMUs give you a pretty accurate compass heading. Good IMUs, good, good, like IMUs. A... good gyros give you a good one. The right now, I don't know about the BNO eighty eight. I haven't looked at that because I got, for my use of the BNO 55 was good enough. Yeah. Uh, but I'm hoping it's better. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, it's cheap, cheaper, I think, isn't it? It's yeah. a yeah. lot yeah. cheaper. So yeah. if I didn't have one, I'd go get the BNO 88 because I think it's 10 bucks and the BNO 55 is 35 bucks. Oh, I thought yeah. it was more like 20. Is it twenty? Okay, um, but, it is but it's cheaper. cheaper. It's cheaper. Okay, good information. Yeah. When I get there, I want my robot to run around the house, and it kind of needs to create a map of the house and right. and then know where it is in the house. And I mm -hmm. had this idea of using my sonic sensors to say, okay, that thing is this far away, and I know I'm about here, and triangulating off of that because my thoughts is that just calculating the where the wheel think you are, that's going to be eventually off more and more and more. You've got to have a way to correct it. Yeah, I want to say there's a real, for, for the class of robot you're talking about, there's a real good instructable, you know, <laughs> we, you know, I was telling you there's good ones and there's bad ones. There's a good one for to get you the beginning ideas of all that. Cool. And I'll, I'm going to drop off here and see if I can find it for you. And I'll put it in chat. Okay. Thanks. So, okay. Well, and Doug, my experience with the BNO 55 was that um, there it does take a trick to get it calibrated. In fact, you have to kind of do this thing with your robot where you yeah. you know, put your robot into a figure eight until it calibrates, and it then gives you a um, a pin basically like a software pin that says it's 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 accurate. And then it's pretty accurate. I mean, it tends the BNO 55, and the reason I've upgraded to the 88 is apparently it doesn't fall out as quickly, but the 55 will get calibrated, hold, and if I rotate my robot, I can see it actually following the compass pretty good, but then it'll fall off. Like if I set my robot driving around, all of a sudden after maybe 30 seconds, it'll just drop and it doesn't know where the compass heading any, is anymore. I really what I have for an indoor robot is you don't really need to know three degrees versus five degrees. I really only need to know kind of like 180 degree accuracy, which way is north and which way is south, roughly. Right. Kind of where the walls are going in the halls and everything. Yeah, because like one of the things about a like one of the things I wanted to do in terms of a behavior based robot was say go south or go north, and I would just say right. that robot, and it would just head to the north side of the house. Or go to room three and look out the door. Be yeah, well, probably read about robots where like the they have the moth and the anti moth behavior, where you have two photo cells, and just using two soda photo cells, the robot will head either away from light or towards light and it's kind of the same thing if you say to a robot always kind of favor going north then no matter what if that's in the behaviors even after bumping into things and going around things if you always favor a north movement eventually the robot will end up at the north side of the house right even without having a map yeah i think it's going to be interesting when i get there <laughs> i'm still yeah. trying to get it to, to do other things right now yeah, it hasn't turned around and come back yet. It's just gone straight, and that's just <laughs> mostly straight. <laughs> yeah, my application is um, map the the kitchen floor, uh -huh. <laughs> but, and and eventually find out where it's dirty. 
Oh, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. We got this vacuum mopping mo robot idea. I think it was. Yeah, I, I think people would buy it if if it could clean the tiles really clean. <laughs> so I will buy it. <laughs> so yeah, that's it's kind of my, you know, like the way for defect inspection, right? It's it's got its own pattern. These grids of the kitchen tile, mm. and and those are all repeating patterns. At least that tile will stay there. Mm -hmm. So if I, you know, if I scan once, uh, the next day it comes back. Oh, there's something dirty. <laughs> it will, it should be able to match the pattern finally. Yeah, I think I blew it when I built my house. I have one foot uh, slate tile like throughout most of the house, but it's on a diagonal. It's not, you know, parallel to walls. It's uh, at an angle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can't use that to follow. Yeah, don't do it for orientation. <laughs> it's, it complicates things. It's not as simple as an XY pattern. It's, you know, uh -huh. out of 45, basically. Uh -huh. so. The other thing I want to have the robot moving is I want to see it's like a smooth motion, not like on off motion, but rather, you know, turn the curve with the operator. Huh? With yeah, with a good radius, um, mm. and you know, speed up, speed down, with 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 some grace, smooth, smooth, yeah, you know, with some grace, yeah. not can, just yeah, uh, all with motion profiles. I mean, you can see yeah. turns are going to be like this, and you know, yeah. accelerate and quicker and quicker, and then slow down, and you can you yeah. Can I, I think I'm gonna. Put a motion profile there. Have the feedback following it. Yeah, I'll find out how how, how accurate it goes. It's there kind of a, the scanning motion where it's it's following a you know zigzag triangular triangular line. It, it's not the same, but uh, I mean it won't be the triangular shape triangular shape, but it will. It's kind of a predicted error. So I can further. Well, you know, inverse it to make it more like a triangular shape on the design. One of the things that David Anderson mentioned that I kind of took to heart, and this is like, Doug, you should take this to heart as well, is that a, lab a laboratory that has square walls that are painted white and all that, of course you can make a robot that operates in that, but one of David's points was is that our houses, which are often where we're running our robots, aren't like that at all. And I was just thinking about this idea of wall following I don't even know if I've got even a three foot patch of wall anywhere in my house where the wall is actually accessible to the robot. I've got exactly. chair That's legs, couch, half of a piano sitting in my, you know, there's just, I've got nowhere that actually has clear wall. And so, and there's also, when you're going along a wall, you go into a doorway that's closed. It, you know, it goes in and out again. And so David's point was that houses are pretty hazardous for robots, you know, that yeah. to be able to navigate a real house with chair legs and all that is exceptionally difficult. I expect it um, to be. I yeah. think my robot's going to have to bump around avoiding obstacles a lot and hopefully create a map of where the furniture things are and then come back and say, oh, look, somebody moved that darn chair. Now I know it's new spot because I bumped into it with the one supposed to be one. Yeah, or someone left a shoe on the floor. It's going to be very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's something similar that I want to do to map map the floor. But yeah, I don't know. Are you going to use a camera, Doug? Thanks, Doug. Oh, yes, I will have a camera for facial recognition, and I'm not sure what else I'm going to be using it for. I know. I'm going to have a remote control mode so you can drive the robot by watching it through the camera and, and controlling it RC style. But uh, I haven't figured out what else I'm going to be doing. I've got, got a lot of Instructable stuff, not from Instructables, but from Pi Image Search. I, I bought the really intense course from him that I haven't looked at very much yet that does a lot of open CV stuff. And, Mostly right now, I'll just use the facial recognition part and add in other stuff as I need it. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. I've followed his stuff and I bought some of his material. Like, I don't know how many years ago now. Um, 
but I th he's got, I think, one of the best, you know, references for OpenCV and anything you can do with cameras and um, AI stuff. I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty good. His stuff is definitely pricey, but um, I, I don't know that you'll find a better reference. Yeah. Um, That's what I'm expecting there. Yeah, Jan, um, I don't know if, uh, do you have animals? Cats, dogs? <laughs> I do. And he hates the yeah. robot. Oh, he hates the robot? Yeah. He I don't hates know the robots. One of your rambas has ever done it, but uh, mine seems to find where the cat threw up and then runs through it and prints the oh. house. <laughs> <laughs> so now whenever I set one out, I've got to scan the floor looking for little spots. Like, oh my God, there's one right there. You know? Must yeah. protect the wiring if there's a animal, little dog or cat around. <laughs> yeah. My my wires. Um, one thing I'm glad about wiring before was it it, it never gave me trouble with. I guess it's like three months. I wired it up. Every time I plug, all I do, all I need to do is plug the USB cable in, and it's the the motor is rotating. <laughs> so yeah, it require. I guess if there's an animal around, it probably won't stay this way. That's yeah, right. Yeah. So anybody else get hit with a storm? Carl, you experience anything? Well, I mean, I, I think I was on the leading edge because I might be the most west uh, of the Dallas area group here. Oh. Yeah. So so it's basically from Paris on down. And right now it looks like it's over at Terrell. Yeah, there we go. Terrell self was praying. Here a while ago, I think about the same time as it came through Carl's. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was just too loud because the laptop with the microphone is about a foot and a half from the window and it was slamming against my window. Yeah. So, uh, but it was over briefly and here we are. Yep. Hopefully, Kareem's okay. He, he said he had to leave because there's a tornado heading his way, but let's see. Our siren yeah. came off, but I didn't see any. Yeah, I'm back yet, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you may not. In the band, there are a couple purple spots. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there are bound to be problems out there somewhere. Yeah, I'll have to go out tomorrow morning. I know it, it broke that glass top table. Uh, I did hear hail, so I uh, have several vehicles parked outside. So. Hopefully there's no hell Hopefully nothing major. Oh, no. Just survive. Okay. Alrighty. Well, are we uh, pretty good? I think we've gone around the table, round and round. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. It looks like around ten thirty. So. Yeah. <laughs> so like the girl need to get going. Morning's coming quickly sleep. on us. So. Yeah. I think we're. I think I'm going to check. Five o'clock in New Zealand. It's coming up to dinner time soon. So okay. Yeah. Yep. So it's good to see you guys. Right. Yep. Take care, guys. Have a good Thanksgiving, and uh, talk to you next time. Take care. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye for now.